a lot of LSPs have uh, actually done more harm than good. It wasn't a school anymore. It was a business. Every time there is a trend, a hype, whatever, we feel that we are way ahead. No, we're not. We're still way back. Nobody can just crack your skull open and feed it into you. You either have that or you don't. I get in the bin. <laughs> so I rush out, I get in the bin, I get the copies out and say, sorry, sorry for ruining the party, but in two out of the three manual, the brand name on the front cover is wrong. What? Yeah. Let's start very simple. Where are you guys from? We're both from Greece uh, in terms of citizenship. Right now, though, we are located in different parts of the world. Uh, when we started the company, I was based in, uh, in England. I was living there since 98. And um, that's how I bumped into Yanis uh, in my previous uh, career when I was uh, teaching translation at uh, University of Surrey. And Yanis, uh, now he will tell you his own uh, journey from Greece uh, to Berlin. <laughs> I mean, now uh, as well in the last uh, four years, I've been living in uh, Riga, in Latvia. So we're a bit all over the place, but this is like uh, how Lexka has been since the beginning, completely decentralized. And we were doing work from home when it wasn't trendy. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we'll get to the part where you two actually meet a little bit yeah. later on. Yeah. Maybe give us a context, because I know that we were joking about this during our first call. Um, can you give us maybe some sense of how, how distant you are when it comes to the age? Like, what is the age difference between you? Oh, it's not that big. Not I mean, that I'm, big. I'm, I'm 49 years. now. Yanis... 43, I'm 43, but it's 49. Okay. Yeah. It's not bad. And Dimitris is somewhere in between us, I think. Uh, no, it's uh, 43. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Because I think that when you were first telling me that, I don't know, like Vasily was the university teacher, I thought that you were like, a, I don't know, like a fresh graduate or something like that. Like there was like a huge cap. So no, okay. So no, you are almost no, the same. No, because um, when I started teaching, I was also very young. Uh, basically, mm. I started the year after I finished my master's. So I was 26 at the time. And I met Yanis when I was, I don't know, in my early 30s, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So it was all... Uh, and, and you got this all the time. I mean, I remember at the time we were getting groups of 70, 80 students and all the time you would get maybe four or five students in that cohort which were older than I was. That was perfectly yeah. normal, right? Okay. It wasn't just fresh graduates out of a language school. Right. So, you know, you got all sorts. And um, there were people who would come in uh, with experience in translation, not a lot necessarily, but mm -hmm. especially the, um, the older uh, students back then, they were either looking to have a career change, let's say, or they were already working in translation for a few years, but they wanted to get a kind of certification, something that would help them develop their careers a bit more. So, you know, different people had different motivations to pursue an MA. And that, they still do. I mean, it's still the case. Um, it's just that now the circumstances in higher education are very different, in the UK especially. Um, the numbers of uh, students who have been studying languages at uh, lower higher education, let's say in high school or anything like that, they're far fewer now than they were before. They've been declining for years, in fact. So now you get into a situation where in the UK you can hardly get enough translators into English. The same problem then spills out in the EU institutions, for example, in a way, it's good that Brexit happened because now only Irish translators work in the EU, right? <laughs> so you don't have to worry about it. But um, it's, it's uh, something that does have an effect on the industry as a whole because that kind of creates a bottleneck in the supply of new translators in the field. And that means fewer people can then start thinking about specializing into technical translation or localization or engineering or things like that. 
And that's where a lot more of the, ma- of the demand in the industry will come in the future. It's not going to be just uh, traditional, let's say, translation studies. But anyway, right. that's a completely different conversation, of course. Right. I was just going to say that, okay, I'm going to play along and continue asking the follow-up questions. But if you say it's a different topic, then okay, maybe let's cut it right it here. Is, well, let's say I don't want to go too much into things that I haven't been in touch with for quite a long right. time now. The truth is I left academia like eight years ago almost. So it would be hard for me to claim that I know exactly what's going on right now. But my experience with that kind of decline that had started before I left is that now there is a much bigger shortage than before in terms of new people coming into the industry. Okay, so I still have to ask since we're still talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So even even if you when you were in the in the in the part of the ac- academic world, like why did you think this decline was happening? Well, in the UK specifically, the bigger reason had to do with a systemic uh, problem in the UK, uh, which started, I'd say, about 15, 20 years ago when uh, they started promoting STEM subjects in uh, lower education more than humanities, social sciences, etc., which meant that a lot fewer younger students were interested in languages at all. If they were lucky, they would get one foreign language to be taught as an option in many schools. And uh, that wouldn't necessarily be even promoted actively, right? So most of them would need to get all their A-levels in maths and physics, etc. But whatever foreign language they had in their in their arsenal, it wasn't necessarily pursued after they finished with their lower education. So when they had to apply for courses in a university, they might get, let's say, a mixed degree where they get to study business and Spanish, for example, or something like that. But not necessarily, let's say, language and translation. Translation would come usually as a kind of an afterthought and mm-hmm. postgraduate education, at least in the UK, for the majority of cases. In other countries, uh, things might be different, and I'm sure they are. Um, in Greece, for example, it's almost compulsory to have two langu- two foreign languages in um, uh, high school, for example. One is compulsory, and then you get to choose one amongst three other choices, let's say. So the idea of learning a a foreign language is something that is much more promoted and it's not frowned upon. It's encouraged. So the UK generally has a different uh, market, both in terms of education, but also in terms of uh, employment later. meant that they wanted to put emphasis on other industries that they wanted to develop further. The other issue that also played the role had to do with the fact that both in education and industry, the UK, as part of the European Union then, could attract a lot of talent from other countries. So they didn't feel that they had to necessarily develop their own resources in the long run. They could make up for the loss of talent by recruiting talent from other countries. And that was the case. That is still the case for many industries, because there are people now who work in many of these industries that have been living there for more than 10 years. They're permanent residents, they have the right to live there, so there's no problem. But for other sectors where this mobility didn't exist, it's becoming more problematic to make up for the loss in talent. So now I think this problem is going to be even further exacerbated uh, now that the UK is not part of the EU. They will not have that kind of resourcing availability anymore. And uh, we will probably see LSPs struggling to hire people locally in the UK, and they will have to make up for those losses by recruiting people remotely. It's not a bad thing, of course, because now you have a broader horizon. But uh, finding the right fit for your company might be more challenging because exactly you don't 
see them at the office, right? You don't know who they are, basically. <clears throat> One thing that I'm curious about, curious about, so the way I understood it is that um, the systematic reason was that, I don't know, let's say the government or the education system started promoting more STEM subjects versus translation. Uh, I have a very weird parallel that maybe I'll share later on, but even if, let's say, students were exposed to, I don't know, translation studies and STEM at the same time, do you think that people would actually choose translation? Or do you think, like, ultimately it's based on what people like? Like, like do you think, like, more exposure to something could tip the balance a little bit? Or... Well, less exposure cannot be a bad thing. So if we look at it the other way around, the more exposure that they would get to this combination of STEM plus languages, let's say, not even translation, the chances would be higher that they might see technical translation, let's say, as a potential career path. And these days, we wouldn't even be talking about technical translation. Most of the time, we would be talking about language engineering, natural language processing, mm -hmm. machine translation, all those things that are basically exactly the interface between language studies and computing, for example, or hardcore localization engineering, at the least. In either case, there are roles today in the industry that didn't even exist like three or five years ago. So even if I try to compare to what was available in the industry when I was teaching, I wouldn't be able to tell you that there is an overlap because there are so many new things out there right now. And uh, academia is always slower to react because as an institution, it is slower from a regulatory point of view. You know, you have to jump through a lot of hoops to create a new program, a new study program, and uh, to get your new module descriptions, to get new tutors, to find the right people to teach these subjects, and to make sure you have enough students to run the course, because if you don't, then you don't run it. There are all sorts of uh, challenges. Even for well-established universities, these are challenges. And now that they don't have this same let's say, funding source by recruiting more students from the EU who used to have easier access to these institutions, now they have to rely on other uh, methods, let's say, in order to attract more students. So they might get more students from Asia who have to pay higher fees or they have to diversify the number of modules in their study programs, which might be optional or compulsory so that they can attract students from other parts of the university to study modules in the language programs, let's say. And they pick and mix. That way they have bigger numbers in their classes. But, you know, these are institutional challenges for universities. Uh, generally, I would say, not just in the UK. But the UK had this additional layer of uh, complexity because of the lack of native uh, students who would be willing to further their language studies to go to higher level right. in a nutshell. <laughs> let's say. We could talk about it for a very long uh, time, but you know, as I said, I'm a bit reluctant to go into more detail on that topic in the sense that I've been away right. from the from the field in a while. We also have a second guest here, Yanni. Oh. <laughs> Surprised. Oh. We're already online. <laughs> um, let's go back. Let's go back to the early days because I like talking about these topics. So maybe Yanni, you can start with this one. How do you remember your childhood? Right. Uh, like growing childhood. up in Greece. Yeah. yeah. Um, like the first thing that comes to your mind is it a positive experience? Uh, it is a positive experience, which uh, had to do with a lot of play and a lot, lot of studying. So, uh, but then we didn't have the chance to learn languages at school. So we had to go to private schools, private language schools after our classes. This is how it worked. So I started learning English and French uh, very early. 
Uh, so English when I was five and a half and uh, French when I was eight. And uh, I did finish my studies in both languages uh, back then when I was uh, almost 16. But as I said, these were courses that we had to take in private after our classes. So, you know, if you wanted to have any extra activities like uh, music or football or whatever, uh, it all amounted to a very steady schedule. So at some point, when you were preparing for the university, let's say you know, from 16 to 18, uh, everything had already become too much. There was a lot, there's too much weight on your, on your shoulders. And it's not very easy to handle a situation like that at that age. Especially, you know, when most of our parents were not able to understand what was going on. You know, they just wanted us to join the university, you know, get our degree and get a job and that's it. Like, like what it used to be. So, uh, obviously back then, people didn't know anything about translation. I had uh, the opportunity uh, to have a, a relative who used to be like half, who is half Australian. And um, I did some classes with her when I was uh, 15. And she said, you know what? If you get that degree, then, you, then there's another degree, which is a translation degree. I said, oh, so what's that? And it was like an extra translation degree from English into Greek and Greek into English, uh, which, uh, quite frankly, I, well, I succeeded back then, but I'm, I'm pretty confident I would fail now if I, <laughs> if I tried the same thing. Like, uh, I had studied that much back then that I succeeded. That was 95. But uh, now, yeah, I would have definitely failed. Anyway, and uh, the system in Greece doesn't really, is not really ideal. So if you want to become a translator, you have, and you want to study translation at the university, you have to go through a specific syllabus. You have to, so there are four days, or oh, it used to be like that. Uh, now it has changed a bit, but nothing has really changed in the core. So at the end of the day, I studied mathematics at the university. I dropped after five years before I get my degree. Uh, so five years later, I dropped mathematics and I switched into translation. There was uh, the British Institute. Back then it was like a private uh, institution. Uh, I studied there translation from English into Greek and Greek into English for two years. And the British Council uh, Institute, sorry, British Council. <laughs> yeah, uh, British Council. And I also did uh, the French into Greek and Greek into French degree, uh, a similar institution in my second year. Uh, so then I applied, uh, we all had the chance to apply for a master's in the UK. And uh, well, <laughs> A few months later, that was uh, 2005, I landed in uh, Surrey with my huge uh, suitcase, which included a desktop. Uh, I, mean, I even, I had even, it was my first flight. I didn't know what people <laughs> carry <laughs> with them in their flight. So I just put everything, you know, <laughs> and uh, I remember, the, <laughs> the <laughs> I remember the, the girl back then who said, uh, sir, you know, this is 57 kilos and the limit is 25. I said, sorry, I was born in a village. I don't know how to apply. I said, okay, come on, next time. It's fine. <laughs> uh, the problem was that if I, once I landed in Sari, I could not open the suitcase. So <laughs> I had uh, an issue there. Anyway, um, and this is how I got to know Vasilis, who was my one of my professors at the master's. And uh, so once I did the master's, I applied for a PhD and looked for a job in Surrey. Uh, Vasilis also helped me get that first job back in 2006 as a QA specialist at the local LSP. And, uh, well, now the story, <laughs> now <laughs> that part of the story that Vasilis <laughs> used to tell his students. <laughs> right. I think, Never I think it, if I, if I, if I can hit a pause, because you yeah. guys really like going to your to your school area and the university and when you when you met i actually took a note here like the first thing yeah. that you said that you had to study the language at the private school okay. does that mean that you had to be from a certain family let's say income wise to actually even no. go there no yes? it was like no? pretty much everybody was attending that kind of private schools they were like 
cheap private schools. So I didn't okay. have private classes with a teacher. The, the ones who came from rich families had private classes with a, an expensive teacher of English. It was mm. not even paying. a class. The, the yeah. tutor would come at your place, you would sit down for an hour or two and have a lesson, like for a couple of times a week, let's say. But otherwise you would do it in a, in a school, but it was a language school. It was just for that, for nothing else. And you're saying, and you're saying this is still going on? Oh yeah, in yeah. Greece, really? Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's very popular still. So, is that the main way how how Greek youth learns new languages yeah. through this yeah. private? Well, if you're thinking of the formal system, then yes. Otherwise, they learn um, English, let's say, through watching television, right. listening to music, everything that works for everyone else works the same way in Greece too. Can, can you explain to me why is it not integrated into the, let's say, the main education It is more system? integrated now than it used to be. But back then, um, let's say, language learning was more like an optional uh, class uh, rather than a compulsory one. So you had the choice not to take it, whereas nowadays it's considered you know, absolutely essential. Um, but also the fact that um, uh, the level of tuition, the kind of quality of tuition that you would get in a public school was not as strong, was not as mm-hmm. good. So a lot of people would go to the private schools to compensate for whatever they didn't get in the public school. Uh, but it was also that uh, everything was starting kind of late, meaning that when I was asking my parents, I said, you know what, I want to learn English. And I was five and a half. I said, we don't know what that, that is, but anyway, uh, let, let's do it. But otherwise, my next option would be to start at the age of 13 at school and do one or two hours max of English a week. Meaning that, you know, at 18, you were still like, I eat, you ate, and so on. <laughs> you, know, you were still there, <laughs> at the same level. Uh, so... <laughs> Now I think they've started learning uh, English. They start very early now. Earlier. Uh, yeah, even uh, I think B class, let's say second year at school, yeah. you, you would start learning the foreign language. Yeah. It's been like that for years now. I think that that's very interesting, Gani, what you just said, because my question was, at first I was like, why did you decide to study languages um, mm-hmm. optionally at such an early age? And then I was like, wait, you are just so young, so you're parents probably forced you but now you just said that you actually went to your parents to ask about it so yeah. can you explain to me why does a um, six-year-old want to right. learn languages like why why did you feel the need to know english that's a good question because there was no uh there was nothing in my family in my broader family environment which would kind of help me understand what la- what language is i mean there was nothing which could which would even give me a sign with regards to languages or translation or language learning, whatever. Or even with regards to books, like there was no single book at home. There was no book, right? <laughs> and, you mean in uh, English or in general? No, in any, in any, in any language. I'm not, okay. I'm not talking <laughs> about English. I'm talking about any language. And uh, I still remember it was like, uh, so when, when I finished my first, year at the primary school uh my teacher back then who i have to say is still alive uh, now she's almost 90 years old no 85 or something and uh, we still call each other once a year she weird told my mother yeah it's weird <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, yeah. did, did you have a did you have a crush on her when you were it's a special yeah. relationship <laughs> okay <laughs> Or she. <laughs> okay. Oh my God. Where is this going? Okay, we'll, we'll cut this. We'll cut this anyway. We'll do some editing. Advanced <laughs> editing. <laughs> anyway, and uh, she told my mother, she gave her a list of books. She told my mother, you know what? Uh, this guy is really interested in what we're doing here. He's not like the others, like the rest of the people who check out of the window all the time and so on. He's really focused. So I'm giving you a list of books to buy him. My mother got the list, she bought me the books, and then I needed more books and so on. And this is how uh, everything started. So 
This is why when I studied mathematics, which I love later on, I was not really motivated to uh, get my degree in math and uh, then do a related job. Just because, you know, that was a shift away, like a huge pivot away from what I was dreaming to do. I wanted to do something which would combine languages with computers. This is where, I mean, I loved, I've always loved languages, literature, computers, and math. Can I combine all the two, all the, all four? Sorry, not two, but all, can I combine all four? Well, back in the day, it seems that I wouldn't be able to do that. Now I can, you know, like NLP in a way is, uh, well, it's probably the way to combine all four. Right. Um, but, um, yeah, this is not something that I thought 20 years ago. Back then it was like, okay, I'm dropping, uh, math to get into translation and, uh, become a trans, become a translator and, uh, we'll take it from there. So I, it was a failure. Like I didn't get, it was a huge failure, right? I didn't get my degree in math. So what am I doing? And in fact, I didn't switch to translation immediately. I switched to translation. I switched to kickboxing for a year. <laughs> and, then I, <laughs> and then I switched to translation a year later. Like, okay, now I'm mature enough after I've been beaten uh, a thousand times. I'm mature enough <laughs> to okay. move to an office job. You get, you <laughs> Start get kicked in the again. head enough and then uh, it starts yeah, yeah. making sense. <laughs> it, it works. It works. I advise everyone uh, who watches this podcast to do the same. <laughs> I'm not sure if I zoned out or something, but I'm still not sure if I if I understand like why does a young person want to learn languages? Like what drove drove you to it? Was it curiosity? So it was what I think because I'm not sure. Like I've tried to decode this. It's a great question because you know it for me it has been like a psychological question. I've been trying to dive into the source of this for a long time. And it was it was like that. My father moved to Germany before I was born, right? But uh, he moved back to Greece a couple of years later. And uh, I don't know why I had a crush <laughs> with regards to Germany. I, like, I always wanted to live in Germany when I was, uh, I think it had to do with football and so on and what we were watching on the television and so on. We had, uh, it was, like all of our neighbors, we had three neighbors and all of them used to live in Germany. So they were bringing videotapes, VHS, uh, but everything was in German. So it was Jackie Chan in German. You know, <laughs> it was mostly about karate and Western, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, anyway, so everything was in German and I, I couldn't understand anything, right? And I was a bit furious uh, against my father, like, why didn't you stay in Germany? I, I would have been able to understand all this, right? And uh, I was feeling that uh, there were, there was a huge part of the world that I was missing, that everything was like Greek centric and around me, but I wanted to get out of this Greek bubble, like with all respect to the Greek bubble, I wanted to get out of it, but I couldn't find any other way. You know, there was no internet. Uh, there was, uh, I, Vasilis lived in Athens and, but I lived in a very small city, in a very small town, not city. And, uh, you know, we didn't really have anything. We didn't have any cinema or theater or whatever where you could really expose yourself to something different in terms of culture. So it was, a, I think it was a kind of early reaction. Uh, it was my need to expand myself. And now when it comes to my kids, I see that I kind of, uh, I'm a bit, I'm not a bit, I'm probably too much. Uh, proactive when it comes to language learning. So my kids are exposed to languages from a very early age, meaning that they start with Greek for me, only Greek for me, only French from their mother, only German in the environment, and so at school and so on. And when it comes to watching films or whatever on their tablets and so on, everything is in English. So starting with passive learning and so on. And, uh, you know, multilingual brain, so it's something different to become multilingual at a later age. Yeah. So we all kind of speak multiple languages, but we became, most of us became multilingual at a later age. So we've missed a few things. Um, our neuroplasticity is a bit different. You know, we're there, but those kids, not my kids, but 
<laughs> the kids of this generation will probably be there, right? Um, so I, yeah, I, I don't know if the, the word need uh, is ideal, but this is what I feel like I needed to expand. Like, otherwise I was feeling like I was missing too much. Right, yeah. I, I I laughed a little bit because to me, like I imagine it like a like a six year old, Yanis comes to his parents and he's like, "Hey, mom, dad, I want to expand myself." <laughs> like, like, like what? <laughs> but but actually, yeah. Like, do you think you were seen as, as by your peers as a sort of a nerd? Because you mentioned oh, yeah, that you I like was. really like to study a lot, which is oh, unusual yeah. for. People. Yeah, I, I I was a nerd. I was a, like a, I was like the school nerd, uh, absolutely. And uh, this is why you know when people met me later on at the university, people who didn't know me before, they were like, "This guy, you know, he's a complete failure. He doesn't really do anything. You know, he only watches football and so on. He doesn't. He fails every single class." Uh, which was true. It was like uh, five years of not being able to do much. I was refusing to move on, you know, with my life. It was like a huge hiatus. And, uh, yeah, but, uh, you know, I, I mean, if uh, I feel like uh, if you haven't done something in your life, but you still feel like you can do it, like, uh, you know, um, even, even if you're 26 or whatever, we feel like, oh, you're 26 and you haven't finished your studies in whatever, your first degree, it doesn't matter. It's like, uh, you know, you can become, uh, when I started, uh, when I switched from translation to programming, I was uh, 34. I was 34 with a newborn child. So, and was it challenging? Oh, yes, it was challenging, of course, because you feel like you're starting everything from scratch. Everybody around you, around you says something like, oh, come on, you're 34, like you're too old. What are you trying to do? I mean, you're not 20 anymore. Like you will not make it. Right, but uh, there's no uh, age restriction uh, when it comes to when it comes to being motivated enough to start something, to learn something. And there's no age restriction when it comes to learning. Uh, my issue with a lot of people, <laughs> I have to say, is that uh, uh, they're never. They, I feel like they're never motivated, mm. or they feel like you know, I have my degree. At, 22, I can live the rest of my life like that. I can have the same job and so on. I wish I have the same job. Like, I don't really need or want to learn anything more than that. Uh, for me, uh, okay, maybe the word failure is too much, but these are personal failures, like not being motivated at all uh, to move on with your life. Did you, did you ever think about why people, let's say, choose this I don't know if, if I should call it comfortable path or they think it's comfortable, mm. like why they don't want to expand themselves. Uh, for, I think that for every single one of us, it's very hard to get out of our comfort zones. Like for me to turn my camera on and have a podcast with you, it is hard. And it might be hard for you too to interview other people. Like, you know, you say like, I'm a bit stressed, but I will make it. Even if you've done it 200 times, right? You might still be, stressed um, and you get out of your comfort zone in order to do that but there's no other way so uh, I think that uh, it has to do with uh, social examples or the examples of our social circle around us if we see a lot of people in their comfort zones kind of enjoy a relatively happy and stable life and so on we feel like well you know it can still work why should I take that many risks, right? Um, like, uh, I think you had told me you moved from Slovakia, Slovakia to Canada, right? You could have stayed in Slovakia or you could have made moved to a smaller village in Slovakia or whatever. Even they, smaller. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> there there is always case, smaller. Not... <laughs> I can start uh, my but... own village of one person. Right, you can start your own village. Right, as an introvert. <laughs> um, and... Uh, yeah, it's very easy to reproduce the same thing. It's very easy to say it is too late to start this. It is too late to do anything. But um, 
I feel like the people who were saying when they were 25, they were saying, oh, it's too late to do that. Uh, you know, they still say at 35 and 45 and so on. It becomes a pattern, which is very hard to break. This kind of pattern. It, it is hard to break. It is, I mean, it is hard for all of us. It's like being disciplined, like all three of us. Maybe we say, you know what? I want to learn Ukrainian at the moment, right? And we're starting. And three days later, we're like, oh, now I have to do something else. I have to do something else. Two months later, we haven't moved at all. So maybe motivation is there, but uh, discipline. if you're motivated, then you... Mm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the dis discipline is something else. So motivation might still be there, but discipline is uh, absolutely necessary. It's not only about motivation. Okay, good. I, th I think we got you talking, Yanni, finally. <laughs> so I, I, I think I have to uh, switch between you because otherwise awesome. it's going to be like I'm between one person and the other one. But, but no, I'm, I, I'm, I like this topic. So what, what do you think, Vasily, about this thing? Like why some people choose to stay in their lane and they maybe don't even have the motivation to, to expand? I think if you ask me for someone who is younger... It's probably an issue that they don't feel like they don't want to look outside their bubble. But the older you get, the easier it is to feel like you have enough and you're happy where you are and you don't want to take the risk or you don't want to apply your time on some activity that is completely outside your comfort zone when you feel perfectly happy with what you have with your job with your family with your living arrangements wherever you live and that's all good so it is always a kind of a trade-off whenever you try to get something new going you want to know in advance as much as possible especially the older you are that there is going to be a return on whatever you do, that it's going to be a positive impact on your everyday life, that it's going to help you or your family or somebody else who is close to you. And you need to take that all into account. And if there is an opposite effect, meaning that if you start something new and you start having less time for yourself to rest, for your family to see you, for socializing, for having a work-life balance, whatever that is, then it's becoming more challenging to, you start thinking, well, maybe I don't have the capacity. Maybe I don't want to find the capacity, even if that is there. So you sit back. But as Yanni said, in, let's say in your 20s or your 30s, when you are, when, especially in your 20s, I would say, where when you still don't really know what you're going to do with your life, and no matter what you think you know about your life in your 20s, I can tell you right now, it's got nothing to do with how your life is going to be later. I mean, this we started this uh, company, I was 41. I had no reason to take any of that risk when I left the university at that age. And still I thought, well, whatever I'm doing here, it's not good enough for me anymore. There are things here that I don't like anymore and I don't want to be dealing with them on an everyday basis. So I'm just going to leave. We didn't even have Lexca back then as an option. We hadn't even, we had started talking about an idea, but you know, that was much before. In any case, if you are in your 20s, let's say, and you're still trying to figure out what you're going to be doing in the next 10 years, well, in your 20s, you rarely think about what you're going to be doing in the next 10 years. You might be lucky to think what you'll be doing in the next year or two. Let's say you start with the next two years. The more options you have for yourself, the better it's going to be. You know, you have no idea where that little white ball is going to settle on the wheel of fortune. You have no idea. So you might as well have more options where that little ball can settle on. Even if you study something that might not make sense right now, it might make sense five years from now, 10 years from now. 
You might think that you're studying translation, for example, and some of the topics that you're dealing with are so incredibly boring that you want to kill yourself. Don't do it. Nothing is wasted. Don't kill yourself. And nothing is wasted. Seriously. I mean, I've been... Things that I uh, sort of developed as an expertise uh, later on in my academic life, as a student, I thought... Why are we even doing this? This has nothing to do with what is current, what, how the industry is working, let's say, or whatever I thought the industry <laughs> thought was current. But it turned out that you know, some things are fundamentals. Uh, they won't go away, no matter how much the industry advances, no matter what new technologies come forward, etc., even now, let's say with MT, with uh, ChatGPT, with NLP, with all the most cutting edge advances in technology, the language skills are still going to be there. The fact that you need to be able to rationalize and explain to somebody who is a non-technical person, how does this work and why can it help me? You cannot do that only as an engineer. You need to be someone who understands language. So... You know, there's always this uh, gap between different specializations, let's say, and people think that, oh, that uh, side is always right and that side is always wrong. That is never the case. There are always complementary skills that you can bring to the table, no matter how late in your life or your career. And obviously, if you don't have the, the willingness to learn, um, that is not something that's anyone can really imbue them you. So nobody can just crack your skull open and feed it into you. You either have that or you don't. So that's fine. If you don't, that's fine. But if you do, don't let it go bad. Right? Make use of it. I actually have a question about that. So I think you mentioned that you either have it or you don't. Um, I, I would like to think that you can maybe cultivate it, especially from the early age. And that was actually the question that I had for for you, because Yanni, you were talking about like how you teach teach your kids, you know, to to live in a multi language world, to to speak languages from the early age. So how how would you how or how do you try to raise your kids so that they are willing to learn and and like in a way you don't kill their curiosity? Because I think that children in general, like most of, most of them or all of them, I don't I don't know, I don't have kids. <laughs> They're curious, but then, you know, like as you get older, your curiosity kind of like dies off with many people. So how do you make sure that, I don't know, like once your kids are adults, they will still want to pursue new things, try new things, be open to risks? Right. Um, first of all, um, whatever I'm doing as a parent might be totally wrong, right? But this is just it's still my approach based on my readings and my influences and so on. Um, first of all, I I have chosen to treat them as, a, as as if they were adults from a very early age. Meaning that, for example, uh, before our podcast, I described what to the, to two of them because the third one cannot <laughs> really understand uh, yet. He's too young. <laughs> young. Um, I described what we're doing, why we're doing it, who you are. Where I try to <laughs> tell them who you are and so on, so that they build their own impression of what we're doing. Once this is once this goes live, we will watch it together, and you know I will explain some things. We will discuss and so on, right? Uh, if one where of them, where where they're like, yeah. Dad, you're gonna yeah. be on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, 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 because they're a YouTube maniac, right? They want to be YouTubers. This is what they, they just want to be. Content become. creators. <coughs> Content creators. Yes. Um, so, um, what I try to use, I try to employ a personalized approach, which is that uh, kid one is still the brother of kid two and the brother of kid three. But all of them are totally different. You know, they might like totally different things. There are some things that they like, they have in common and so on. But everything else, you know, it's, a it's three different worlds, three different, different clusters, if you want. There might be some intersections, but otherwise, there are three different clusters. So I 
follow them and I jump in whenever I see that there's something that I could contribute. Otherwise, I just, you know, let them grow. And they asked me, so we have developed a relationship of trust. They asked me, oh, so what do you think about that? I do the same when there's something with regards to lexica, for example. Oh, you know what? We have a new client who asked for this, this, and that. Now you're nine years old. You can tell me, what would you do? And he says, and, you're, and you know what? Sometimes they told me things that I had never thought of. I was like, oh, how, oh that, that was obvious. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, how did I miss that? Uh, so I, I don't block them. I don't have high expectations from uh, school. Uh, I try to provide them without as many skills as possible. And skills, when I say skills, it's not only about uh, computers and language learning or books. It also has to do with, uh, you know, their being wired to the nature, like uh, also with survival skills, uh, cooking, you know, cooking. They learn how to cook together with uh, dad and so on. Uh, why? Because I feel that uh, those, even if they even if they choose to live them in their own cluster later on and become too introvert or whatever, they should be able to to survive using their own tools and using what I have tried to provide them and what they have acquired on their own. They don't need to show me that they got one, well, in German it's like one is excellent and six is like a fail at school. It's the other way around. You bring an average of three, it's fine, you know, it's fine because I see that you put some effort. It, it's fine. I don't want, I don't expect you to bring one in every single class. I don't care, you know, and I won't care later on. Uh, if I see lack of motivation or lack of focus or whatever, I will try to understand why there is this kind of lack. Uh, so I, uh, quite frankly, I develop myself together with them. So I try not to be in a distance. I'm, I'm not trying to come from above and like impose my beliefs uh, because I'm biased. You know, I'm 43. I've lived in totally different environments and so on. I have different experiences. So I have a bias, which can be also negative for them. It's not always positive. Um, and therefore, I'm. Uh, I still have like a safe, I keep a safety distance, always with them, but a safety distance with regards to what, to guiding them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, with regards to the skills, I think uh, because as you said before, well, either you have this or you don't. I mean, you can always cultivate something, but it's either you have it or not. Uh, what I notice, just in our industry, for example, but uh, this applies to all industries. Uh, I think we have, let's say, a lot of engineers with uh, no language skills, a lot of uh, linguists, translators, and so on with no tech skills. And then we try to find some product managers or somebody else who will connect those two, which is fine, right? But I think that most of the engineers do not try to reach out. like to the other side. They don't try to acquire any kind of language skills. They don't try to dive a bit deeper into linguistics. Like, learn the basics. Like, you know, you've been an engineer in the language industry for 20 years. Try to learn a second language. Try to learn the basics of linguistics. Just something, you know. You don't need to learn everything. Um, if you are a translator, you've been a translator for 20 years, try to learn the basics of, you know, how APIs work. At least some things. You don't need to become an engineer. Nobody asks you to become an engineer. But you need to understand uh, this because this has to do with your daily workflow. You are the one who uh, kind of passes information to the product manager who will have to translate that information to the engineers. But you know what? You can do a bit more than that. And you, engineer, you can also do a bit more than that to understand what they're telling you. You cannot just expect the doc you know, uh, bullets that you follow. Um, so I, I still see this gap, and I don't know why both 
sides are a bit resilient to learn. Uh, I think that they're both resilient to learn. I think might disagree, but I, I see this gap. I don't know, Andre, about your take on that. I don't want to go into my takes because it's already one, one. It's already one hour in our interview, and we still didn't even get to talking about where where did the idea for Lexica come from, and 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 the reason why I'm saying this is. Not that I'm not enjoying this conversation, I, I really am, but I, I did a, an interview recently with another founder and we spent the whole two hours just talking about these topics and we didn't even get to talk about his company, <laughs> which which okay. should be in a way like part of the interview. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, I'm just I'm just I'm just letting it go. But but yes, I, I, I also want to hear from from Vasily. I, I I assume you have a family? You have well, kids? I'm, or no? I'm I'm married, no kids though. <clears throat> oh no kids. No, uh, okay. I have um, a sister, two years younger, who lives in uh, in England, and uh, mm -hmm. my parents back in Greece. Right. Okay. So I will not ask about why no kids yet, but maybe maybe since you used to be a professor, like how how can a professor, let's say, instill this curiosity or this willingness to learn to their students? How do you keep them engaged? Because I don't know. Like I'm pretty sure that. When you were a student, there were teachers who were like super boring and there were teachers who were maybe exciting and maybe they gave you a glimpse into how the real life could look like. So how, how, how did you do it as a professor? Um, my generic approach was always to have a problem solving element in teaching because that engages somebody at the same level like everyone who's in the group, they feel equally involved and they don't feel that there is anything separating them or feeling them, uh, I don't know, second class or anything. It's the same problem for everyone. Uh, everyone has the same kind of information to begin with. And they all know that they could potentially fail in addressing the challenge, in finding a solution to the problem. And that's not bad. That's not a bad thing. It can very easily happen. The idea of being in an academic environment is that it's a safe place, right? Even if you fail an assignment, it doesn't mean that uh, a customer, you're going to lose your customer. There's nothing to lose. There's always something to learn, but there's nothing to lose. So by presenting them gradually more complicated problems, to try to solve, whether that had to do with, I don't know, difficult terminology in a technical texts that they had to translate or trying to figure out how a CAD tool was working when they had only looked at a couple of things before and nothing more, nothing in more depth, or how to work together in groups to create a company presentation uh, for a group project, which is something that, let's say, is not particularly common in subjects like translation. It's more like a personal study rather than group study. Um, my experience is that all of that kept everyone more alert and more willing to cooperate as well. They started understanding that a lot of the resources that they have are out there. They're not just in their head, but there are things they can reach out to other people to find. Uh, they can improve their research skills, whether online or elsewhere. I mean, at the time when we started, online was nascent. There was practically nothing on the internet. And even then, whatever was there looked like, a, you know, paradise. <laughs> uh, I remember... Uh, when I was studying, the dictionaries we would find online would come through Alta Vista with some uh, very basic links and we would go on, I don't know, some glossary that someone had put together because they, they had the, the background, let's say, in a specific field. And we would see that glossary online with definitions and thinking, wow, okay, this is the future. And now you don't you think of dictionaries and you're thinking, what's the point? Why would I need mm -hmm. a dictionary now as a translator? Well, there are situations where you would need it, and you would also need to know how to use it. 
<laughs> there might be people right now who don't know how to use a dictionary. And you're thinking, you know, you just flick through a page or you find it online and it's, it's there for you. But decoding the information that's in the dictionary can make or break a choice that you will make in a translation, depending on the context, depending on the subject fields. And it's the same for figuring out terminology problems, for example. So these are, let's say, basic skills that you would expect anyone to have, but they don't necessarily get the chance to develop them unless they get involved in a problem-solving situation. Do they have a problem to solve where those skills are required? Yes. Then they will need to develop those skills in order to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. If they don't, then it will be an unknown until later on in their career, they might have to deal with it. So, yeah, I, I mean, there are certain, let's say, subject fields within the field of translation studies where I thought problem solving can apply a lot more easily. And that challenge is there basically for everyone teaching translation at any level and any particular, let's say, subject. People on... Uh, teaching, let's say, the, uh, the more theoretical modules like translation theory and things like that, that was always the biggest problem for them, trying to find something that will connect the theory with the practice. And that's why a lot of students, and I'm sure Janis can agree with that, thought that translation theory was one of the most boring subjects when studying translation mm -hmm. at that level. But that was because it was very difficult to find a practical interface, something that will make them think of how to solve the problem. Practical translation classes have a lot more opportunity for that. So they might have been more engaging by comparison. Do you do you agree with that, Yanni? Or were you the only student in centuries who was like, yeah, translation theory? <laughs> no, uh, no, I, 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 was, I was not, uh, well, uh, yeah. Uh, I was not. I was not supposed to be a nerd anymore when <laughs> right. when I was in the UK. But oh yeah, uh, you were the cool kickboxer, right? Yeah. But I, I, uh, I was still a nerd, and this is why after Vasilis, uh, my dissertation was in translation theory, like in uh, neologisms and uh, philosophy, and uh, my PhD, which I I dropped two years later because I had a full time job at the same time, was. Uh, about the same thing, like comparing uh, neologisms in uh, philosophy. Uh, anyway, uh, but uh, it's true that nobody, so most of the people wanted to have a master's degree in translation in order to get a job as up. And uh, it was paying well back then. So the rates were high. There was no machine translation actually. Nobody was using. You know, everybody was making fun of Sistran. Nobody was even talking about machine translation. Everybody was saying Sistran. You know, it was um, yeah. So the brand name had become a synonym of uh, of the technology. And uh, right, or you say Coca Cola, and it might be a Pepsi or something else, right? And still a Coke. Uh, and. Uh, 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 what surprised me though was uh, that most of them didn't become translators. So they went back, uh, they were going back, in fact, it was not just one year. They were going back and they were not becoming translators. They were keeping this uh, master's degree in order to do something else, to show this as an extra certificate or skill. But uh, when they were facing, as soon as they were facing the reality of being a translator, they were just holding back and was like, okay, I'll, I'll probably do something else. Because even if the rates were high, being a junior translator meant that you still have to work like 10 hours a day back then. And at the end of the day, you would get like 1,000 euro brutal uh, at the end of the month. And it was not the same, like working at a translation agency, right? And if you wanted to become a freelancer and impose your own rate and so on, you would need to have clients, which means that you needed experience, you needed the network and so on. So it takes some time. Who has the patience to do all that? Not many people, right? Um, and it's not only about patience. Sometimes it's also about priorities. You know, some people need to make money as up. 
they have different needs and yep. just cannot wait five years now to, in order to build a network in translation. Uh, and now, obviously, it's uh, uh, well. People think that it's even worse. I would not say that it's uh, even worse. A lot of uh, uh, so I've been translator for um, I was translator for almost a decade, and I was th also thinking back then that a lot of the translators were spoiled, meaning that they, you know, it was like. I'm an expert in uh, game localization. I will, uh, why? Because I have translated, I don't know, two interfaces in different games or something like that. Um, I want 15 cents for translation from English into Greek or Slovakian or whatever. Uh, why? You know, <laughs> this is too much. I mean, it also depends on, um, it also depends on the content. Uh, what kind of expertise do you bring? Because if it, only about translating the words new, open the window, and so on, you don't really bring any expertise. You know, you are, you can be replaced by, and it's not only about technology. Uh, and uh, there are people like that, there are still people like that who think like, you know, I've been in the industry for many years, so my rates will still be high, will always be high. But it's not just about rates. So, uh, the rates are always related to the content. They're always related to what you get. So back then it was something totally different. You know, you, you needed, as I said, you need a bunch of dictionaries next to it. You barely had uh, an internet connection to send back the files, to upload them to an FTP, to take you one hour for one X click, <laughs> and so on, right? Uh, so things were different. And now we have continuous localization, uh, we have uh, we have MT obviously, which is not something to laugh about. So the quality of MT has not now has nothing to do with the quality of MT 15 years ago, or 10 years ago, or even 10 years ago. Um, so uh, we have to adapt. Uh, we cannot always have the same. We can always ma you cannot always maintain the same claims about us or about the world around us. The world changes much faster. You know, we cannot be static. Uh, I would also love to be paid, I don't know, 100 euros an hour to make just an HTML, to add some CSS to an HTML page. Right, <laughs> that's not the case anymore. <laughs> okay, I have, I have accepted it. It's fine. But uh, back in the day, things were changing. I remember uh, my first, so 15 years ago, I started, I joined a UX group, a usability group. I was interested in usability. Uh, I didn't know how to code, but uh, we started building some WordPress websites. And uh, people were like, oh, now there will be no need for web designers. It was like web designers back then. Like nobody right. was talking about web developers, right? And uh, nobody will need any web designers anymore. Uh, everybody will switch to WordPress. Yes, WordPress got a bunch of uh, traction, but uh, we also had a new market. So there were WordPress plugins, WordPress themes, like ThemeForest. A lot of people made money on ThemeForest. So there are a lot of new opportunities. And it's the same for every advancement in technology. When we talk about uh, MT, ChatGPT, WordPress, whatever, it also offers opportunities. It's not only about what we will be missing from our previous state. Our rates might change, our technology, uh, our tech stacks might change. A lot of things might change. But uh, it cannot only be negative. We shouldn't only see the negative aspect. And I think that we're often too selfish and we, we're, often, we're often too selfish and we think that... So selfish and biased and we think that when something affects our rates or our comfort zone we think that it's negative we don't you know we refuse to see the positive aspects or prospects of what may come from this opportunity yeah i think it could be very much related to what we were talking about before like people's comfort zones right because like this new advancements basically i don't know crash your idea of your comfort zone and like what has been working for you so maybe that's why people are hesitant 
Anyway, speaking of advancements and innovation, uh, let me quote something. The conceptual seeds of lexica were sown so soon. I don't even know how to say the word. Sown. Sown. So, yeah. so. Back in 2013, when Yanis realized that there is a gap in the localization industry. Can you give us quickly a context of what you were doing at that time, like professionally, and what, what, what was the gap? How did you realize the gap? So, uh, I'll try to make it as quick as possible. As I said, uh, Vasilis helped me get my first job as a QA specialist in an LSP in the UK back then. And they were, what they were doing, they were localizing all Bentley manuals, you know, the cars, automobiles, uh, all Bentley manuals into 13 languages. Uh, and uh, a friend of mine who used to be a student of Vasilis uh, worked there. So I asked her, like, uh, so Mary, how, do you, how do you do QA there? I said, well, oh, there's no QA. We just, you know, we translate, we send things out, and we get them back, and <laughs> we print them. And uh, I said, okay, I have an idea. May I talk with the boss? And said, I don't think she will accept you, but uh, I will give it a try. Anyway, uh, she made it, and I had half an hour with her. And the boss said, uh, uh, what did I say? I said, you know what? There are some QA tools, and back then it was very basic. There was... QA distiller, like first version or whatever. QA distiller, Aerospy, and uh, Xbench, those three, uh, if I'm not wrong. And uh, I said, you know, we can automate a part of the process. So what you're getting back, at least, at least, we can have a generic quality control to make sure that what you get back from the Chinese or the Hindi translators uh, doesn't really include any critical errors. At least let's avoid the critical errors. And she said, look, uh, I don't really have any position open or whatever, but I will give you one month to prove me that this thing works. Right. So uh, to cut a long story short, second day in the company, and there's a party, there's a morning party. Everybody's happy because they just sent to the printers all 13 manuals. Oh, no, in fact, it was not just 13 manuals. It was... Uh, three manuals in 13 languages. It was 39 manuals, right? And it was something which would cost like 1.3 million pounds, right? And uh, I said, uh, where, so uh, I was still a nerd, right? So, okay, uh, you party, but where is what, where are those copies like that you sent to the printer? <laughs> and she said, oh, it's in the bin outside. Okay, I get in the bin. <laughs> so I rush out, I get in the bin, I get the copies out and say, sorry, Sorry for ruining the party, but in two out of the three manual, the brand name on the front cover is wrong. What? So they started cursing, obviously, and firing everybody. <laughs> Anyone? Anyway. And uh, yeah, so they had to pull everything back. Uh, she called me at her office. She said, OK, now you have a contract. Uh, I, I mean, I had, it, I had done manual QA, <laughs> still nothing automatic, right? But then I convinced her and uh, we bought a couple of uh, QA distiller licenses and so we automated the part of the process for the next printings and so on. So then I started uh, working as a translator after I left. I went back to Greece a few months later. I started working as a translator. I noticed that nobody was doing any QA at that translation agency, which was supposed to be like the number one in Greece. And... Uh, and then I moved to SDL in 2009 as a contractor. I was mostly doing the reviews and evaluations, but it was like full time. And again, nobody was really doing any QA. Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay, let's talk with uh, their one of their big clients. Like I was the team lead for one of their big clients, and uh, I said, "Shouldn't we use? Is there any QA mechanism on your platform?" No. All right. Um, do you think you can use that? They had an online. They had built their own online platform. And I said, do you think you can use that? Well, no, because this is a desktop tool. So we cannot really use Xbench, QA Distiller, and so on. Uh, we could use them with a hack, but we don't want people to download our data, keep them, and so on. You know, we don't want people to be able to download TMX 
and reuse them. Uh, so I thought, okay, there's nothing like online QA. There, and there was nothing back in 2006. There was nothing in 2009, but now it's 2013. It's late 2013. Uh, somebody should start something. Um, so I, I invited four friends of mine, two developers and uh, two linguists. I said, we could start a company uh, which could build something like that. I don't know how to build it. I'm not a developer, but you are the developers. Uh, we can give you all specifications and maybe we can build the first version, like, you know, uh, a beta or something, like an MVP, in fact, an MVP. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, they were interested, but all of them were full-time professionals and uh, they didn't have any time. One of so the multilingual boys is in the room. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we uh, we dropped uh, the idea quite easily because uh, I mean there was no company and so on. But uh, I also decided to uh, drop translation and become a developer uh, because I I just didn't want to be there anymore. Like I didn't want to be working in something like a factory. It was like a factory, like being in a factory. I had you know constant deadlines. I was feeling almost burned out. And uh, then my mother said, oh, you know what? Uh, your brother-in-law, so Dimitris, who is married to my sister, he's really good at computers. So it was like, this is what she said. She, he's really good at computers. She didn't know he was an engineer or something. He's good at computers. <laughs> anyway, uh, you can talk with him anytime. So I talked with him. I said, uh, you know what? I had this idea. What do you think? Oh, well, they said, you know, we could try it. And uh, I mean, I was always talking with Vasily Samson and he was about to leave academia. And I said, uh, you know what? I've been checking some, uh, I, I've noticed that a lot of people get funding. Uh, so I studied product, product management for, uh, uh, for a couple of months. And uh, I said, you know, there are multiple ways to do it. And especially in Berlin, Back then, it was like, you know, everybody was getting a funding. And uh, we applied to several uh, institutions. Uh, and we ended up in Rome, where Translated was also part of a cohort which was offering funding. And uh, Translated, so the people from Translated uh, saw a presentation. We, uh, we discussed and... Uh, they were already planning to build some QA in the platform. So they were like, well, you know what? You already have that demo. If you can execute and have this in six months on MateCut, let's try to do it. So we got the funding from them. And uh, we did the integration with MateCut. Uh, I think we started with four languages, I think. Yeah. In June 2016. In French, Italian, and German. Right. So it was in June 2016. And, uh, well, the lexical integration is still uh, active, but now we support 150 locales. It's totally different. The scale is different. And uh, uh, so this is how it started. It was more like uh, there, there is a gap that nobody wants to feel or tries to feel for any reason. It, so 10 years ago, it was generic. 20 years ago, it was generic. Like, why does, no, why does nobody take care of it? And uh, we decided back then to uh, take, take some risky decisions. For example, we said, we will only be cloud-based. Mm -hmm. We will be API. So imagine that was December 2015, in fact. So things were not like now. Things were totally different. Uh, people were using extension verifiable QA. They were using mostly Trados and MemoQ for translation and so on. So MemSource, it was still uh, an early phase XTM MemSource and so on. They were still like uh, early cloud-based Trados copies, if you want, in a way, like trying to move crowd, uh, Trados to the cloud. Mm -hmm. And uh, so many years later, that's the question. Still, nobody really deals with quality control. So a lot of people talk about quality. A lot of people talk about quality, about LQA, about quality assessment. And you know, it's easy 
or it's a bit easier to talk about quality assessment because you don't really need to do a lot of tech work, meaning that uh, you can uh, build the platform to support quality assessment. You can have a lot of discussions on panels about quality assessment. <laughs> okay. Uh, of course, he, uh, it was like uh, still like something that a lot of people try to hide under the carpet. Like uh, uh, we all know that it's challenging to invest a lot of time in building only one module. What I mean is that cloud-based tools have now become like dinosaurs. They're huge. So let's say Memsor started with five features and now it has become phrased and they have 100 features, right? If they need to add a, a reliable QA module for all the languages they support, they need to spend at least two man years, at least two man years. Well, I'm oh, more than that. But anyway, so yeah, it takes a lot of time. Well, we only deal with that module. So mm -hmm. we decided to take the risk early on, not to, not to spend any effort on providing services, for example. Like we will not start with QA and become an LSP or whatever. We will not start with QA and then expand to become a mini TMS or something. We don't want to compete against TMSs, LSPs or whatever. We just want to build that QA module and make it as reliable as possible and as customizable as possible. Why am I saying customizable? Because even when you use an empty engine, uh, you might use, you might say, oh, DeepL is the best. And then you use DeepL for a field where it scores only 33%, <laughs> where the precision is uh, really low, and uh, in something else it scores 95%. Right? It's not an off the shelf solution. You still have, I mean, for MT it's a bit different, but when it comes to tech in general, it needs to be customizable. And uh, so we tried to make everything API first, modular, local specific, customizable, and we tried to change something in, uh, in the workflow, which was in traditional QA, you finish your translation, you click like a QA button, there is a QA report and you have to go back and forth all the time. On maybe, well, best case scenario, there is a side panel and you just go back and forth in your editor and the QA panel. Uh, but what do you do there? You think slow, you don't think fast because you, you read descriptions like segment one, possible error in number one, it should be, uh, yeah. So you spend time reading and they say, oh, it was a false positive. I move to the next one. Okay, again, again, a false positive. And you get frustrated and you never want to do any QA again, right? <laughs> That's one thing. And the other thing has to do with the workflow, like, uh, you know, if, I don't know if you use Grammarly. When we, when we did our pitch eight years, almost eight years ago, uh, we presented ourselves ourselves as Grammarly for translation, just because we were introducing this live QA thing, like as you type. Uh, it's not that we were checking for syntax or something. It was mostly about uh, the engine running in real time, meaning that it would, it would also act as a time saver first. And second, the translator doesn't rely on any reports or whatever anymore. As they type, they see the errors, they fix them, and then they don't have any excuse to say, well, oh, I missed it. Oh, it was just in another report. It was too long to read. I had a deadline or whatever. No, it, it's as you type. So would you use Grammarly if you had to save your email or document, download it, upload it to a Grammarly server? And no, you know, <laughs> it's right. a bit like that. Um, so we try to make it as intuitive as possible. And, uh, of course, it it took some time until we get to the market, meaning that we started with our MakeCut integration, but how do you sign the next client then? You need other integrations, that's one thing. But 
back then everybody pretty much everybody was using Stratos and MemoQ. We didn't want to do in integrations with um, with desktop tools. It's we not only be... we didn't want to, it's not easy to make them. Right? Well, you it's need easy to have if you uh, add the uh, steps in the workflow. Yes, workflow. but you also have yeah. to have a partnership with uh, the platform and you know desktop to online or online to desktop doesn't work very easily. You always have to switch to a different environment in order for it to work. So we want to. And nobody it. wants to change. Yeah. Though, so everybody <clears throat> wants everything, in fact, consolidated into one environment. If they, you know, they want their empty there, their project management there, QA there, everything, can it all be in one tool? Then we will use it. Even if you have the best tool in the world, Nobody wants to do that extra click, open that extra tab, you know, extra login and so on. Nobody. So it uh, it took us a while. It took us a couple, I have to say, it took us a couple of years to first to add more locales because you cannot really be a QA tool with only four locales. You need to be able to cover at least tier one, at least. Uh, that was one thing. And uh, the other thing had to do with uh, with uh, integrations like do you do any integrations if yes with whom and uh, do people actually look for extra integrations or do they expect everything from their cut tool and quite frankly i've noticed that they expect everything from their cut tool uh, everybody complains about their cut tool of their choice, like, uh, you know, they do long RFPs, they pay a lot, they end up with tool number one, and then they complain about what it lacks. And yeah, you cannot have it all, obviously, but still, um, it's as if in, you know, back then we had Trados in MemoQ, People tried to build a clone of those on the cloud. But the thing is that when you try to add more features later on and you are not proactive, meaning that you have not really thought about adding more features, like you try to go to the market, you say, okay, I'll build something similar, but on the cloud. Now I have to add more features, more steps in the workflow and so on. And uh, this gets out of control. Meaning that also seeing some of your live uh, experiments on your channel when you were testing various uh, TMSs, uh, there are popular TMS environments in which even if you have 20 years of experience, you might be spending 10 minutes just to start a project, just to find where that button is, where you need to start a project or open a project. So it has gotten out of control, meaning that imagine being a translator and having to learn all those tools from scratch because you have to w work with a lot of tools at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it becomes frustrating. But um, when it comes to QA, Unfortunately, not much effort is put. So it's always like, uh, I don't know why it's not in their top five priorities, uh, but uh, it seems that it seems that, it, it, that it's in the second, like, it's in the top 10 probably, but uh, definitely not in their top five priorities. And they all keep avoiding uh, discussing LKA. They do a lot about quality assessment because it's easy to say, you know, what we'll add some, we'll add a form, you will, you will be able to add comments and uh, evaluate and so on, right? But may I have a bit more automation? This is where it gets uh, a bit tricky. I'd like to go back <laughs> a little we bit. <laughs> uh... We want to go back too. <laughs> um... <laughs> Going still back to like when, when you brought this idea to to Vasily's, mm -hmm. uh, I think you mentioned that Vasily 
wanted to leave academia. Um, why did you want to leave? And what were you considering as an option before Yanni came with the idea? Well, this is an interesting uh, story. <laughs> the, um, the main reason that back then I felt it's time for me to go is when um, I realized that academia, at least in the UK, in the way that I was personally experiencing it, had started losing its, um, let's say, luster. So this appear, the luster is like um, this veneer, this uh, image. It's it's it, it's something like an ideal that you have about something, but mm, right. then you realize that has worn off and it's not there anymore. And what uh, sort of tipped it for me um, and made me realize, okay, things are not going in a direction that I like, was at a, an internal meeting, I don't even remember when, when uh, somebody started talking about students as customers. And I thought, okay, are we really using this kind of terminology now internally? Um, and mind you, this was not uh, by any of my colleagues at the academic department. It was one of the administrative uh, parts of the university. Nevertheless, that gave me... Um, a very negative impression. And then I started realizing that there are things happening in the background from the various departments, which I have no exposure to, but inevitably at some point they start spilling over. So you start getting that kind of exposure as well. And uh, this created a very negative feeling for me. Um, the fact that it wasn't a school anymore, it was a business. I was there because I was, I, I really liked teaching <laughs> and I always saw it as a school, as that kind of environment. So when that uh, uh, veneer <laughs> disappeared, I thought, uh, okay, well, I think it's time for me to start thinking about leaving. Even though I didn't have any idea about what I would do next. Uh, for a year or two, uh, I uh, switched to part-time teaching. So I, was, mm -hmm. I didn't have my permanent post anymore after I gave it up. And during that time, I was just going at uh, the university for two or three times a week to do a few classes, and then I would go. I wouldn't have anything to do with uh, what was happening in the background. And... Um, I dabbled in photography for a, a couple of years, uh, part-time. That was one of my hobbies back then, which I thought, oh, who knows, maybe I'll try to develop that professionally. Obviously, that didn't work. <laughs> because, you know, if you don't really commit yourself to it, nothing is going to happen. You really have to be there 100%. So it was just a, a full-time hobby, <laughs> let's say. But it wasn't really a job. And then uh, that was the, around the time when, uh, when Yanis sort of shared that idea with me. And I thought, okay, I think there is some potential here because this is not something, you know, that in my experience, both as a teacher and a practitioner, limited experience as a, as a practitioner, uh, I could see that there is uh, a potential there to make a difference. I uh, had nothing to do with... Uh, running a business or understanding technology, how that worked in the, under the hood. So my angle was completely from the linguistic side. So if we were to, say, develop QA checks for a language, what checks should we be worried about first? How do we put them together semantically? How do we combine the languages together? How do they make sense in a system that a user will be able to understand? Them? So that was my personal involvement at first. 
but then after we started the company, then, uh, you know, things evolved in a slightly different way too. I mean, I had to learn things that I had no clue about, like running the company finances or, mm-hmm. you know, writing content for the website, for documentation, for everything. But, you know, I was very much motivated by all that because I knew there was a greater goal in the background and it was always something like every day would bring something new. So we were learning something new every day. And that was part, that goes back to what we were saying earlier about that curiosity that I was curious enough, even at that age and that stage of my life to say, okay, yeah, here we go. Let's do this. And I'm not saying that it was easy all the time, right? It was far from it. It's exactly the opposite. Uh, It's like the hardest thing I have ever done in my life. Even uh, moving country twice wasn't as hard as this. But um, there are rewards that are always uh, implied in a way. You don't talk about making a huge salary as a reward because there isn't such a thing for a a small startup. There are other rewards which uh, make you feel like um, there is a sense of fulfillment. There is something that you are achieving. Even if you don't have 100 customers, you still know that what you're producing is good and that it can make a difference. And uh, on top of... uh, a couple of uh, notes. One is that, you know, at the end of the day, Andre, it's not about who had the idea, you know, because it doesn't really matter. It's about it's because all three of us, it could have been the other way around, like Vasilis or Dimitris having the idea. So it doesn't really matter. But for me, it just started because I was facing that, I had been facing that problem for many years and I didn't see why, I couldn't see why anyone couldn't solve it. And, uh, it was mostly about all three of us agreeing to leave our jobs, which were, you know, uh, well, I mean, we were making quite good money with uh, those jobs, taking the risks uh, at the moment that uh, it, it could be challenging. Like I had a newborn, uh, Dimitris, for example, uh, my sister was also uh, pregnant and uh, he would have kid and then we had another three kids uh, during Lexica. So it was like uh, a lot of challenging uh, times. Uh, so it's mostly about people coming together and not just having ideas, but also executing and insisting, like being persistent at the end of the day. I say, you know what? Uh, I know that there is this need. Uh, it, it is getting more clearer and clearer, uh, we will get there. And uh, as I said, yeah, first two to three years were much more challenging, obviously, until we build uh, a system which would support quite a few locales and until we, until we build the first network of uh, leads who would then convert. Uh, the thing is that uh, the, our case was then confirmed. So, so especially after 2018, when we noticed that uh, even people who were kind of ignoring us back in the beginning, like, uh, you know what, we have Trados, we have MemoQ, or even we're on the cloud, but, you know, we don't need anything extra. They were getting back to us and they were saying, you know what, uh, we need to try this because we have issues with QA. Now we understand what you meant like two years ago that uh, there could be potential issues. Um, so linking this back to what we were saying about uh, motivation, curiosity, and so on, it's also about persistence, like not just insisting on something which uh, uh, just because of your ego, but insisting and being persistent on something that you see that you know, you're very clear about. Like, I, I can see it very clearly. I cannot be that far off. Uh, yeah. 
and uh, sorry, and the other thing, the second note was about uh, it's the difference between being an uh, employee and growing your own business. It's not about money, so you risk a lot. Most of the time you're frustrated with everything. You cannot spend, you know, you cannot spend any time. You cannot take two hours off just to watch a film or whatever, because you keep thinking about clients, technology and so on. You know, your mind is always there. But at the same time, you have the opportunity to grow a team around your company uh, based on some principles, like what we call company culture, based on some principles that you support. And what we have in common, Vasilis, Dimitris and I, is some common principles, uh, which is not that easy for Greeks, like for three Greeks together, finding common principles, like common set of principles. It's not the easiest thing in the world. Uh, but, it, it uh, helps that we don't work in the same office every day. I, I, oh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we have uh, also, we also have, uh, we're, we're different characters, like Dimitri that you don't know much more introvert in a way. Vasil is like, it's like the calm force. I'm much more like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> The crazy guy. The tornado. <laughs> yeah. The tornado, right? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I'm the tornado who tries to control himself. And, uh, like, uh, you know, as soon as we're done with the interview, I will be like, ah, what? If I wasn't I'm a bit calmer, like, I could have been a bit more calm. <laughs> anyway, it's always like that <laughs> at the end. Uh, but, um, I, I think yeah. it's a, I think it's a good balance to Vasily because Vasily seems to be very, calm always has an answer and you're more like rrr, rrr. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <And> so, uh, <laughs> somebody needs to fill the gaps andre the, the silence yeah. gaps <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> i had one question hopefully we can answer this quickly because maybe it's not that interesting for you but um can you explain to me why were you looking for capital like the investment because i'm not sure i'm not sure if at that time the whole lean movement you know lean startups mm -hmm. and, and being lean was already popular or not i don't remember yet but explain to me why you needed money because especially since you're three founders and you have mm -hmm. one who's a developer like you you can do a lot just on your own time uh, may i take this one <laughs> so, just uh, because you mentioned lean so it was like uh uh a buzzword uh when when I stopped translating, it was the 1st of May, 2014, nine years ago. And uh, I applied to the Startup Institute. It was a, an American private institute, which was offering uh, private education with regards to product management, backend development, and so on. It was, uh, yeah, it, it was all about lean development back then. So, the word lean was becoming popular at that time. Uh, well, I don't know about other countries, but in Berlin, it was so hot back then. Everybody was talking about lean. And then it was agile and lean, those two. Agile and lean, right? And um, we were bombarded with those two terms uh, to the degree that I, I never used them <laughs> after that. But uh, one of the things I... I learned there was that even if you have sold, let's say you, you've had two companies, you've made two huge exits and you have like 10 million in the bank. When you start, so this was their philosophy. When you start, once you start your third company, you will look for funding. You will not spend any of your money. And it's not because you don't want to spend any of your money because you want to keep it safe. It's not about that. It was because when somebody else gives you the money, you feel a higher degree of responsibility. And uh, I was convinced, uh, to be honest, in the beginning, I thought it was BS. Like, come on, what, what does he say? Like, uh, okay, I've saved some money and so on. But then seeing how easily I was spending my money that saved money in, in between, uh, without really 
having any responsibility towards me, towards myself. It was like, okay, it's my money. I can do whatever I, I want. I, like, you know, in the next few months, I want to be able to do this, this, and that. And I was thinking, right, but if that money came from an investor, would, I, would have I done the same? No, that would have been a totally different story. So that was also a challenge for us. It was something that we had never done. So if somebody gave us 30,000, uh, what can we do with that 30,000? Can we, so we have to execute, we have to, let's say, build an integration in six months, right? We built it in three months. Oh, so now we're three months ahead. So it was making us much more responsible in our first startup effort. And I was then convinced that uh, this would be the way uh, to go. It was not, uh, as I said, in the beginning I wasn't, but I was gradually convinced that uh, this way you become, you can act more responsibly. Was that a mutual agreement between the three of you? It was. To seek capital? It was. I, I We didn't really see any other uh, way of doing it, to be honest, in the beginning. And the same thing happened even a bit later when uh, uh, there was an offer from our investors to get another piece so that we could use that to grow more quickly. And at that point, we refused. We uh, preferred to grow organically because we felt that it was th- that approach was better suited to our characters, let's say. We didn't feel comfortable giving such a big piece away and then basically lose control of how we would run operations. Right. So, you know, it's it, it worked in the beginning as the additional push for us to, to get things started more quickly. But then later on when uh, we thought that the same kind of involvement might have a more negative effect, then we kept the way. And we applied back then, we applied for 13. So there were many accelerators. Um, so we got two offers. So two out of 13. Uh, most of them, most of the others didn't reply at all. But this is something that you have to expect when you act, when you apply to an accelerator, which has nothing to do with translation, localization, so on. They don't even know the terms, like what's localization. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's always better to apply somewhere where it makes uh, sense. And, uh, but as Vasily said, we didn't, we had the, we could have gone for a seed day funding, for example, later on, but uh, that would have not been us. So it has to do with uh, how you're structured. Uh, and we preferred the organic way. And uh, we, we also thought that the timing was not good. So let, let's say having a seed funding to build an online API-based QA tool back in 2016, like it was October 2016, for example, when we were checking that, like, okay, nobody really uses the cloud yet that much, let's spend that time to build uh, the Lexica engine. And if nothing work, works in the next 12 to 24 months, then we can consider a funding round, let's say. But uh, it worked before we considered. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we kept moving organically after that. You can... Um choose to ignore this question i'm curious how did you distribute the shares like what is the share ownership between the three of you and how much is it for the for the investor i i yeah, i think that uh, with regards to the investors and the advisors because we also have three advisors uh, based on uh, based on the agreement this investment uh, what's called this investment agreement there was a name that's it investment agreement yeah investment agreement yeah uh, we're not allowed to share details we cannot uh, disclose of that. It, yeah. it mostly has yeah it mostly has to do with them right um, uh, yeah uh, if you want an indirect answer 
we have tried to be as uh, democratic as possible, <laughs> if you want, and uh, since the beginning. And uh, when we when we felt that uh, something could be a bit more uh, fair or adjusted to be fair or something, uh, we discuss it. Like this is what we do every time. Uh, we don't agree on everything, but uh, we're not here for uh, we're not here to make more money is not the number one goal so we're here to build something it's it's what we said in last time it's what it's about problem solving right and since uh we have a common goal like to make this thing grow like to try to solve this problem we cannot offer a perfect solution to this problem but try to solve as much as possible of this problem we understand what each one of us offers or sacrifices and so on. And we're all on the same page. So uh, we haven't, we have never had uh, issues with that. Uh, in Berlin, for example, I, uh, um, it's, uh, let's say, something like the European startup capital. And I remember back then, in 2015, we were said that, we were told that a new startup is founded every 20 minutes. Of course, uh, another startup closes every, <laughs> or goes bankrupt every 25 minutes. But anyway, that's another story. And uh, a lot of the people I knew back then started, founded a company with people that they didn't really know. It was more like, oh, you're good in business development. I'm a developer. Let's work together and you do marketing. Okay, let's work together. But they didn't really share the same principles. They were not on the same page in general. And uh, everything was, everything ended up as a disaster, as a disaster, although the idea was good, the technology was great and so on. So it's not just about the product. It's also about the people behind the product. And this is how, why, when we built the, the whole Lexica team, uh, it was more like okay, every time we add one person, that should be a person we feel confident that they share the same values. Uh, whenever there's a failure, they will not fire back to us or whatever. Uh, and uh, this has worked. So speaking about the common principles that you share, what are those? Common principles? Uh, you mentioned a human or, or Vasily, if you don't remember, uh, something at the beginning of our conversation about uh, work life balance. Mm-hmm. Right? I don't know if there's such thing. <laughs> right? When I mentioned yeah. it, I laughed. I don't know if you uh, caught that. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. I, don't, I, I think there's no such thing. But let's say that there's approximately such a thing as work life balance. This is different for everyone, and which also means that the daily needs of everyone are different. So, a woman who has a like a female employee with a newborn has different needs, different schedules. She can work different times during the day, and so on. If you think that she is valuable and she can work with you, then you don't care if she will work nine to five. She might work like two hours in the evening, two hours in the weekend, and so on. She can split her day as long as there's no deadline. And we don't really have deadlines because we're not a services company. No, we build our product. We have a broader deadline, meaning let's finish this in the next three weeks or whatever, right? But um, if there's anyone who has a deadline, it will be the developers. Most of the time, like if we have to solve, uh, to fix a bug or do something else for a client. But otherwise, the rest of the people don't have deadlines. This means that when we tell them, when we agree with them that they will work for, they will be working for 35 hours a week, no extra time, we don't count the time. So we trust that they will be spending 
that time, which might not be 35, sometimes it's 25. But if they manage to do their job in 25 hours, that's good for them. You know, we don't need to do any micromanagement. So we hate micromanagement. So it was more about being able to trust people, uh, being able to, uh, to experiment it also with it and see, would it work if Andre, if if I work with, with Andre, that, well, I don't know Andre. I don't know how he works. But based on our discussions, let's say I trust him or I start to trust him, right? So uh, let's try this, Andre. Let's work together. We will be having a couple of meetings a week or what, whenever you need to and so on. We're mostly responsive with our mobile phones all the time. So you can ping us anytime whenever you need to. Uh, but you don't need to worry about the rest. You have to finish something you have. No, it would be great if you could finish this by Friday. Or how much time do you think you need? Oh, I think I need three days. Okay, let's take four and let's talk again in four days. And if you need anything in between, we're talking about that. Uh, this has worked for us. And this is totally different from uh, what we had experienced in translation agencies and so on with a, l a ton of micromanagement and of course deadlines are a reality you cannot really avoid them in a translation agency but micromanagement is something that you can avoid you know or you can reduce to the minimum to the minimum um so uh this is uh, one of so let's say if we summarize this principle it has to do with trusting that uh you work with adults, meaning you, tro you, you work with mature adults who will not be trying to cheat you. And if they try to cheat you, you know, pass for them because one way or another, you will realize it sooner or later. It's always like that <laughs> you know, in, every, in every field. Um, this is, so this principle of trust, if you want, and good faith, some people might call it naive, it might be naive, I don't know. But for us, it is about good faith and trust. This is the main principle. And uh, the other one has to do with uh, transparency. Vasilis will be able to add more, obviously. Uh, for me, it's also about transparency, like uh, not trying to find any uh, any excuses or cover up, make any cover-ups and so on but uh, try to be as transparent as possible. Not everybody needs to know uh, everything about your company. So your junior uh, marketing manager doesn't need to know everything about the status of your company, but they need to be able to understand what your company does to a certain extent. So always try to share as much info as possible. Some things always remain confidential, obviously, but uh, you cannot isolate them in their own, let's say, junior cluster where they have access to no information at all, right? Just try to create connections within the company without being distant or whatever. Oh, and last thing, sorry. <laughs> last thing, uh, which is not really uh, easy for anyone, I think, when they start a company. Uh, when you start hiring people, you often expect them to work as much as you do or to be committed as much as you do. And even if we don't admit it, most of the times we're like, ah, okay, but they didn't reply. It was like Friday evening or whatever. Like, we feel like, okay, we shouldn't be like that. But so it's, all, it's a continuous struggle. But you should never expect uh, someone who works for you or with you to be as committed as you are. If you are overly committed, that's fine. People have different degrees of commitment. They also bring different a different value to what you do. You know, you have them. You have hired them because they can do something that you cannot do, right? So it's not only about commitment. At the end of the day, it's you know like network. That's it. I shut up. So Vasil, that was more, prin <laughs> more principles. <laughs> That's all right. Well, I I can't really think 
Uh, something else that would be more uh, central to all that. I would probably only add um, that any success that the company has had is everyone's success, and we try to share that with everyone. There are many different ways to that you can show that. You can raise somebody's salary even when you don't think they actually did anything to deserve it, right? But they can you can still afford to get a, give everyone a bonus, for example, if you got a hit big contract, everyone is contributing to that kind of success in their own way. And the other part the other thing I was thinking of while Yanis was uh, speaking now has to do with the relationship that we have with our external uh, uh, collaborators, uh, our contractors, because over over the years we've used dozens of people in order to be able to build the the checks that we have for all these different languages. And our experience, uh, you know, when we were on the contractor side, has been generally very <laughs> negative. <laughs> let's say, with most of the agencies that we had to deal with, so. We wanted to make sure that we always have a, a much better relationship with them. So is the job done? You get paid on the same day that you give me your invoice, for example. There's no reason to wait for 60 days to get paid. You have done the job. So here's your payment. Uh, do you have any questions about anything that happens during the project? If I can't help you, somebody else from the team can help you. So always an open channel. You know, you don't treat them like um, some external partner who doesn't need to know anything and they, you just let them figure everything out on their own. And that has, uh, that, I don't know, it has created for me at least every time we have this kind of uh, back and forth with external partners, they always... Uh, look to work with us again because of the, that experience that they've had before. And it's not, you know, you hear all the time about translators, oh, I never want to work with that agency ever again. Even if they give me more money, <laughs> I still don't want to work for them. Well, that's one of the things that we really have tried to avoid very hard and with a lot of people because we know where they're coming from and we know what they should be expecting. So if we can provide it, why not? Right? It's the right thing to do. <clears throat> and we personalize that part or, or, or our approach to that part, Andre, meaning that um, we're not, it's not that we have like a pool or a database of uh, linguists for uh, Asian and African languages, let's say, and then we pick the one with the rate or the deadline, depending on the rate of the deadline and so on. Uh, when we find someone, we uh, we have a call with them, which is often a long call, like to understand their background, like what they do and so on. And imagine being in uh, living in, I don't know, Ghana or uh, Thailand or whatever, and feeling that, uh, you know, somebody send you the project, but they don't care at all. Like what we had in our translation days, we were receiving something from an MLV, like, okay, this one you deliver it by tomorrow. That one and that's it. Nobody knew anything about us. Um, we, uh, as Vasily said, we try to develop those relationships. We don't want those one-off relationships. We don't want someone just to deliver something and that's it. What we try to build up. And uh, it's uh, not surprising that quite a few of them, even you know, three, four years later, send us like uh, Christmas wishes or whatever, but personalized ones, like not just <laughs> chain emails. And uh, uh, they don't ask for uh, projects and they know that we're done with their language. But they say, oh, you know what? I would like to tell you that uh, for one more time, but I really enjoyed that, those three weeks uh, working with you, for example. For us, this is a huge reward that we, you know, we don't really exchange for anything. 
I have so many notes here. <laughs> I'm trying to think about which one to ask. Ex- explain to me. So since we're talking about <clears throat> how you deal with the contractors, how does the collaboration actually work? Um, because also, I think when you're comparing it to the traditional LSP setup, it's just a different situation, right? Like they handle and work with them on a different level than you do. So from 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 what I understand is that, I don't know, you reach out to someone and you're trying to ask them like, hey, what should we be checking for your language? And then you implement it and then you're done. Is, is that it? Or is there some sort of an ongoing um, commitment? Uh, the commitment initially for us to develop, let's say the checks for a new language could take weeks. It's not uh, something very simple to do. Uh, then as a next stage, perhaps if we, uh, let's say, decide that we need to invest more time to fix up a dictionary, a spell checking dictionary, let's say in that language, and for low resource locales, a lot of these languages don't have any, any anything that you can use. Uh, so you have to build it from scratch. That takes another few weeks, at least, to build. Um, and this kind of involvement as well, especially for some of those, uh, let's say, more exotic locales, the linguist who takes part in that project feels like they are involved in a project that is special for their language. It's not just a translation that they're going to finish tomorrow and then nobody will remember it. It's something that will be there and it's something that they will be able to use, let's say, if hmm. Lexka is integrated, let's say, in a tool that they use somewhere. So they are a lot more motivated, more challenged personally. Um, and even before that, the, the fact that this is not a translation project, right. and it's like a linguistic consultancy, if you like, it's something that they don't do every day. And perhaps a lot of them would like to do. They would like to have mm. the opportunity to do that. And one of the things that I hear very often is that, you know, guys, some of these questions that you have for my language, I have never had to think about. I don't even know how to answer these questions. I have to do research for days sometimes to to figure out how these things work. So uh, that gives them a new kind of perspective and a new incentive to be more involved with what they do. And implicitly also, they also realize that there are other opportunities out there, that there are other kinds of jobs that I could be doing with my skills apart from just translation. And this is one of the things that technology has sort of allowed to grow in a much more uh, aggressive way, let's say, in the last few years. The fact that your linguistic skills are not just for translating or interpreting. They are for anything that has to do with language technology. It's just that you haven't had the chance to, to do that yet. But sometimes the chance emerges, like... (laughs) <laughs> for a project like ours. And uh, they get a completely different sense of uh, involvement. So that's why I think we get that kind of positive reaction a lot of the times. Yes. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, you're like the, I don't know, the hot chick that you meet in a bar <laughs> once once in a blue moon and then you go back to your boring wife. <laughs> So, so yeah, so that's why I completely understand like why the contractors like working with you because you're special and you provide something different. But, um, but yeah, do you, do you by any chance give them some sort of a credit? Like, let's say I use Lexica. Can I somewhere see like who is behind the checks for, let's say, Thai language? We can't technically do that somewhere where we could say we have only worked with one linguist for one language because that's very rarely the case. But what we do usually is we can provide, let's say, LinkedIn recommendations on their profile and say, you know, this person has helped us develop the checks for that language. So, you know, people know that they have done this kind of work. But we don't necessarily. And so this is the recommendation letters too. Yeah, right? yeah. And the we recommendation can letters. References, whenever 
yeah, or, they want to get a new job or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that that has happened many yeah. times before. Uh, you know, this is not something that everyone necessarily even thinks about, but you know, at the at the end of a project like that, we always tell them that you know, feel free to reach out if you need that kind of thing. Someone who doesn't need it, they don't need it. Okay. But uh, because it's a kind of a different service as well, it's not necessarily something that they need to prove to someone else in the future, at least very often. From a different bucket, going back to how you split the roles. So I understand that Dmitry is the, is the coding genius. Uh, Vasily was originally uh, there for the languages. So explain to me, maybe this is a question for Vasily. Why is Yanis the CEO? Well, Yanis is, <laughs> let's <Okay>. say, <laughs> apart from the uh, the progenitor of uh, the idea behind Lexco, this mm-hmm. is not just a, an honorary title. Uh, he is the one who is basically right in the middle of everything. If I were to say that Dimitris has a distinct role and I have a distinct role, Yanis can do a bit of both. And plus on top, there are things that um, you learn on the way about the role. For us, when we started and we got together and started thinking, okay, now what title does each of us get? It was just the three of us in the beginning. The last thing we cared, <laughs> we cared about was what title we're going to get. But we thought, okay, what's the more natural, let's say, selection based on the skill sets that we each bring to the table? So, Dimitri's CTO, fine. Uh, I have nothing to do with the, the coding, so I can't be anywhere near any of the technical roles. So, what's the more generic one? Operations. What's left? There you go. You have Yanis. But and Vasilis, what's in fact, left? was not just operations. Yeah. Because Vasilis, uh, uh, Vasilis, in fact, he acquired another skill uh, which had to do with uh, finances. Meaning that Vasilis is actually also the CFO. So he does everything which has to do with the financials of Lexica. I mean, we don't add like CO. Slash CFO slash CMO. We still so have an account, by the way, right? So I'm not doing that. Right, we do, we right. do, right. we do. Obviously, just to be clear. But uh, but he did. So whenever so at the first level, whenever we have to do anything which is about financials or legal stuff, uh, it's always Vasilis who has the first take on it. Dimitris and I, we have no clue about it. Um, and as I said, uh, you know, in our original, in fact, originally we were only writing something else, such as co-founder, like we're three co-founders. And then I think one of our advisors said, look, guys, this is ridiculous. Like, get over it. Just get <laughs> get an acronym, acronymize yourself, and, uh, <laughs> you know, you have to become a bit more mature. And... Uh, yeah. Among the three of you, are there any weaknesses that you don't cover? Like you as a group of three, is there weakness that you have as a group of three? A main one has to do with uh, uh, our reluctancy to expose ourselves. Like this is common across all three. Uh, whenever it comes to interviews, presentations, uh, conferences, and so on. I think all three of us are really, let's say, really good probably at being at having one-to-one conversations with people, uh, not talking business now, you know, like, but uh, uh, getting to know someone. And uh, I think this is uh, something where all three of us are probably quite good at. But uh, just put us on a stage and ask us to present something. Oh, I suck. 
for sure. Dimitri is probably <laughs> even worse, or even worse than me. Uh, Vasil, <laughs> Vasilis can do it uh, very well, but he avoids it, meaning that he's right. he uh, he's obviously much better than us. But uh, he also avoids it, like he doesn't want the lights on all the time. Uh, I used to do it more so we don't want, in the past, yeah. but you know, I kind of got over it. <laughs> you know, for academic yeah. conferences, you had to do it all the time. So I was there. I was out yeah. there a lot, but you know, for for a professional setting, it's it feels very different to me. And uh, I will always be more reluctant. The same way, for example, that all of us have a hard time going out and about for sales. No. Like our business development is basically only inbound. If somebody comes to us and asks us, you know, can you tell me about Lexco? Mm. We can tell you everything. And it might work. It might not work. But outbound sales are basically non-existent for us. It's... Uh, cold emails or cold calls, uh, you know, <laughs> there's nothing like that. Anyway, there has never been anything like that. And, yeah, even if we're talking about really large translation buyers, like coming very close to us and then uh, disappearing for some time. And we were not pinging them at all. And they were getting back to us, let's say, two years later, and they were signing. But I think they were also surprised, definitely not impressed, uh, but surprised by the fact that uh, they were coming so close and then we were not even sending an email for a couple of years or whatever. <laughs> like, okay, they are, what's wrong with those guys? It's just that uh, we feel that, you know, uh, if if the company comes, if a company uh, reaches out to you and they know, they, they reach a stage where they know what they can get from you, they know their expectations, they know what you can offer, uh, they will probably get back to you once they feel ready, or they will never get back to you. You don't need to ping them every wing with a uh, week with cold emails, cold calls, or whatever. There's no need to. It does work this way too. I mean, this works, but it doesn't work for everyone. It doesn't work for us, <laughs> definitely. Right. Yeah, I I feel like. Um... I'm going through the through the same thing, like with the with the inbound marketing. Like I'm not doing any sales. I don't go to conferences or anything like that. Mm. Um, so in order for that to work, um, your marketing needs to be somewhat there. How how would you rate your marketing on a scale of <laughs> <laughs> one to ten? Oh, yeah. You don't even need to ask. You don't even need to ask. From a scale from so, uh, in a scale from one to ten, we cannot really. Because yeah. one yeah. would be too much. It doesn't fit the scale. <laughs> <laughs> right. Our yes, goal okay. is to reach one at some point. Yeah. Our goal yeah. we're, <laughs> not yet. I'm there yet. We're, 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 we're joking about it. So explain to me if your marketing is at level zero. Uh, why do companies, how do they still find you? How do they contact you? Is it just word of mouth? Is it references? Huh? How does it work? A lot of, uh, a lot of it comes through the website. So we, we mm -hmm. did do some SEO work some time ago, okay. and it seems that every now and then one of them will crop up. I think also... Well, the, there you go. It, it can be zero, yeah, right? Yeah, if yeah. It's well, zero. Let's say last year it was one for a few months, and then it went back to zero. <laughs> but I, I, I can't put it all on that. I think the needs of many companies are changing, and uh, they are being more proactive in how they search for different services. And when they, let's say, Google, I don't know, quality assurance or LQA for translation or something like that, we will be up there inevitably. And when they realize that our uh, platform is entirely online on the cloud, if that fits their uh, infrastructure, then they will be interested. So they will reach out. And that is a lot more common these days, that this kind of profile matches what we offer. 
there are I think there are also a couple of things uh, on top of that. Uh, one has to do with, with a comparative study we did together with NIMSI a couple of years ago. When we were comparing, or we and they were comparing Lexica with other QA tools, but also with the QA engines of established TMSs. And uh, we see that people, even two years later, they get back to us and say, you know what, we just we're NIMSI partners, we just read the, that report, and you know, we have exactly that issue. Can you help us uh, solve this? Um, that's, so this one thing. And the other thing is what uh, you mentioned, uh, Andre, which is the word of mouth, meaning that uh, especially in our industry, I mean, it, it's also about your goals. Do you want to sign 1,000 Small to medium LSPs, then this will not this will not be the word of mouth or whatever. There you need SEO, marketing, and so on, AdWords, whatever, a lot of integrations and so on. But in our case, we only target translation buyers. We have three four LSPs, but our main goal has always been to uh, sign translation buyers, and this is our focus. And translation buyers, you know, they meet each other, like those managers meet each other at a different level quite often. And they say, you know what? We've been using Lexica for the past six months. Uh, it has worked fine for us. Why don't you try it? And uh, this is how it works most of the times. Mm -hmm. So this is not an excuse for the, the lack of our... <laughs> Marketing, right? <laughs> <Not> <laughs> excuse. Uh, but um, yeah, you know, we were also thinking that if we overdid it with marketing, with SEO, like what did SEO bring us? It brought us a bunch of small LSPs for which we would need to spend a lot of time in support to put out the way. Somebody right. uh, signs a contract of uh, just 500 euros a year or something, but you need to spend 100 hours with them at the end of the, in a year, right? It's better if they don't sign because <laughs> you, yeah, you know, it will ne you will never do any other development work or whatever because of that support. While in large translation, oh, sorry, in large translation buyers, what we've noticed is that. You know, they have their own developer, uh, the, uh, development teams uh, and the what they expect from you in terms of support is mostly reliability. If your API is reliable, if what they get back is reliable and you are also responsive, that's it. They might not even email you for, uh, for a year and you might think, oh, they're probably not happy with the service. And then they are like, oh, well, let's <laughs> let's uh, renew for the next couple of years. We're very happy with it. You know, we've never had issues, for example. Right. So I guess poor marketing is a way how to qualify your leads. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, but explain to me the, the whole idea with, with your, I don't know, business model or your concept. Why translation buyers and if translation buyers does it mean that the translation buyer needs to have their own platform where they handle translations yeah. so that they can integrate and why would why isn't it better for you or maybe even more profitable to integrate with a tms because mm -hmm. with tms basically the tms does the selling for you like they have to find their own clients and you're already part of the 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 bundle or the package can you somehow explain this? When uh, uh, this is an excellent question, uh, and the, I have to admit that uh, I was like, okay, he will probably ask it at some point. <laughs> he should probably ask it at some point because uh, we uh, so we follow this model that you described with regards to a TMS integrating Lexica. And then, kind of either re either using it for across 
all its clients or reselling it to some of its clients or whatever. You know, we have this, uh, we have variations of this model in our integrations with Metcalf, TransFX, and Crowding. And now it will also be Easy Lock uh, TMS by Deolink. So there will, this will be like the fourth integration working more or less this way. But uh, when it comes to integrations with Phrase, XTM, Localize, and so on, uh, we try, we injected, so we built a Chrome extension for all of these, for free, in which we were injecting our live QA in a side panel, meaning that you type your translation in phrase XTM or localize, and there is a small side panel, in fact, bottom panel most of the time, where you could see, uh, all highlights, like, like Grammarly in a way. It was like a clone of your target segment where you could see all the results and you were fixing everything according, accordingly. Uh, however, none of the three were interested in uh, taking this further. In this case, we would have to build a much more advanced Chrome extension. In fact, we would have to port pretty much the whole Lexica to a Chrome extension. And Lexica now is not like Lexica version of 2016 or 2018. There are a lot of servers. There are a lot of NLP modules which reside in their own server and so on. There are a lot of things that you cannot, that even if you port them to a Chrome extension, this becomes just too much. That was, that's one thing. But even if you do it, the thing is that then you also have to support, to do extra UI support. Those people change their UI all the time. So UIs, even one slight CSS change on their end can uh, break the integration. And uh, so even if the integration does work in the back end, you don't see it in a way and you have to work on it all the time. This can be frustrating. So in order for us to advance an integration with uh, within the TMS, our agreement should be like with TransFX, MateCut, Crowding, and so on. Meaning that both of us do the integration together. We help them and they help us. It's not like us coming from the outside, trying to inject code in with various hacks because a Chrome extension, what is it at the end of the day? It's like a little hack. It's an official hack in a way, right? Um, this is not how things work. This can only be like an MVP. And this is why we built them back then. It was like lightweight ports of Lexica. So phrase XTM, localize. Are you interested? Should we, I mean, we don't really have any QA. Should we, make those integrations a bit deeper, but we need your help to do that. And your help doesn't mean like six, six months of engineering work and so on. It's like just an API. You know, there's no UI to integrate. Uh, but they didn't. So we didn't take it. Uh, we didn't insist on that. Uh, you're right to say that this would have brought a lot more clients, like, you know, having an integration at phrase and uh, being able to sign, you know, hundreds of clients at once, just like that, would have made things much easier. Uh, but uh, uh, what we notice, uh, Andre, is that um, a lot more companies have built their own TMSs and uh, Either by using open source, like installing, uh, like either by using private installations of open source tools, like private installations of Matecat, and then asking for an API key, or building kind of basic clones of some TMSs without being overcomplicated. You know, a CAT tool doesn't need to be overcomplicated. A cloud-based CAT tool. You can, you see, even MemoQ, they have this uh, web-based CAT tool, MemoQ Trans, I think, or whatever, which is a lightweight version of MemoQ. But for translators, it's fine. You know, it's 
It's enough. <laughs> uh, but a lot of people in or maybe are, not <laughs> the way you're laughing. I'm, I'm, la- not, I'm, I'm, la- I'm laughing because I'm not sure what, if, if they change it. But when I was trying the the cloud editor, it was like the worst one I've ever seen. Mm. But but like the yeah. desktop, like all the translators love MemoQ desktop. Yeah. But the yeah. cloud one is like so legacy. It's like so old fashioned. It's crazy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but let's Sorry. say that it's enough. <laughs> enough. No, let's say that it's enough for translators. Let's say that it's good, it's good enough. <laughs> Uh, so, a lot of people develop their own uh, versions, also because they can control data. They can con- so one thing has to do with privacy. Another thing has to do with cost, meaning that even if they have a lot of money, they if they can spend let's say three hundred thousand a year for a lot of licenses on a commercial TMS, they prefer to spend those three hundred k in two US-based engineers, for example, 150K each, who will be maintaining that TMS internally and nothing will be going out and it will be theirs and they can do whatever they want. And uh, they also, so they also change their conditions. It's not just about pricing. Sometimes they say, for that price, you get five seats and unlimited work and then you see that it's not about unlimited volume. They have assigned a certain volume of words to every seat, but they say it's unlimited volume. It's not. Like, you know, a lot of things like that which frustrate translation buyers. And they say, well, you know, we can take control of that. And uh, this has become easier in the last uh, two, three years from what we've noticed. I don't know how to ask this um the best way but when i was reading about lexica the first thing that definitely struck me was like it's api only and i i think i'm like from what you're sharing i i kind of like get the sense but also at the same time you're comparing it multiple times to grammarly is there is there ever a plan or like a thought in your mind to i don't know make lexica like develop the ui and make it accessible to let's say regular translators mm. somehow say we did like um, 50 demos in uh, six months as i said they were not they had no intention at all to add extra steps to their workflow they wanted everything consolidated and uh, the only thing we've done is that we kind of transferred the uh, live qa to the API, meaning that if anyone needs any kind of help in order to kind of highlight everything the grammarly way on their editor, we help them do that via the API. So we have transferred this, a part of that on uh, the API. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think we have a, an environment which could, like 10 years ago, this UI would probably uh, be the next logical step, like moving away from expense, verifica, QA distiller, and so on, to a cloud-based QA process, QA workflow. But uh, but uh, yeah, people want everything consolidated. That's one thing. And uh, at the same time, Andre, quite frankly, uh, people often often have expectations which are not realistic. Meaning that uh, I remember back in back when we started, uh, a lot of the companies we were talking with were saying, "We're like, oh, so do you have any AI? So do you have any anything uh, like auto correction and so on?" And uh, the, they didn't have any issues which would be solved using auto correction. You know, they just wanted to have something impressive in a way. And uh, we started as a rule-based QA tool, a local-specific rule-based QA tool, which became a hybrid then. So a lot of rules with a lot of machine learning at the same time. So a hybrid, because this is what we also find to be working uh, better when it comes to quality control. Like not a black box of uh, a neural network that you cannot really interpret, and not just rules, because language is not just about not a set of rules all the time, you know. And you and also you cannot really maintain 
a system which contains only rules. You always have to add new rules or, ah, now I have to neutralize that rule. Let's add another if statement. So it's uh, an infinite bunch of if statements at the end of the day. So we came up with that hybrid. However, uh, quite frankly, uh, if, uh, uh, so the, we have kept the UI for our demos too. This is where we show Lexica to people and we tell them that, you know what, uh, we think that if you, if you implement QA or, or a separate QA view on your own platform, uh, maybe this is approximately how it should work. Like using filters, uh, with live QA, having history. So we have also everything consolidated in a different view, like this QA view. And, uh, most of them have done it at the end of the day. Uh, one of them didn't. And, uh, two years later, they came back and said, you know what? I will do everything from scratch. We'll <laughs> apply that view that you had shared with us. Uh, just because we had thought a lot uh, about it in the first place. Uh, you remember when at the beginning of our conversation, I said that in most QA reports, there's a difference between what we call thinking fast and thinking slow. So if you have to read the description of an error, you think slow, you have to process the thing. While if you start using something like color coding, it will take you a few minutes, hours, days, or whatever, max. You have 10 categories, let's say, with 10 different colors or strike throughs or underlines or whatever. Then you know that, okay, the red underline is a terminology error or a strike through with, uh, you know, a prohibited word or whatever, blacklisted word. So you get used to thinking fast. But who wants to think slow, especially if you're a translator or, re or a reviewer? And this is a time that you spend without getting paid. You don't get paid extra to QA your work, right? Uh, you see a bunch of uh, false positives. It's a long list and you have to go through everything because there's a blocker. You cannot submit your project if you don't go through everything to, and also tick everything, you know. So what do most people do? More often than not, you just check all boxes, they submit, and they ignore what the report shows them. But this is also how they miss things, right? Uh, there's always that thing that you missed. Okay, two last questions. You mentioned that uh, Lexica supports now one, 160 plus locales, 150. And you started with four, if I'm not mistaken, four or six. Um, based on what do you decide which locale to add to Lexica? 150 locales, yeah. Yes. This uh, kind of changed over time. In the beginning, uh, we had uh, a portfolio of what we would consider essential ones. And we spent the first... I guess, two, three years without thinking about what is a priority because we already knew what the priorities are. So we looked at distribution, what uh, languages had more locales that were spread in more markets. So like Spanish, for example, we had to think about Latin American, Central American, and so on. Portuguese, the same thing. We had to think about Brazilian Portuguese as well. Uh, but later on, it started becoming more an issue of aligning with what our clients needed more. So we started getting more requests about locales from Asia, from Africa. Um, the last big bunch that we did uh, last year was 16 locales from Central Asia, Southeast Asia and Africa. And all these, let's say, are low resource locales, long tail ones. So it always mm -hmm. takes a lot more effort to build a locale like that, to build QA support for it and spell checking. And uh, we have to prioritize. They, uh, well, for some languages, it's also more difficult to find the right people who have the background you can trust, they will be able to help you. But for a lot of them is also the fact that they are just extremely complex languages. Grammatically, they have 
different norms and different standards. There are cases, for example, where, let's say in some Indian languages, there is extensive transliteration and there is no standard for transliteration in any of them. So anybody can do whatever they want. Or there are other languages that have noun cases like Greek and Czech, but you have, I don't know, Georgian that has 10 different cases and another 15 postpositions that change how a certain word will look at the end of its transformation. So getting all that coded into a spell checker, for example, is madness. It's extremely challenging. And it's also uh, something that requires a lot of time to collect the data you need initially. So we might take weeks before we have everything that we need for all the checks that we have. Because our idea is that whatever checks we have, they will work the same way for every locale. No exceptions. The exceptions are that there might be locales that have a requirement for checks that don't exist in other locales. There is, for example, one case in uh, in Thai that doesn't use any punctuation at all. So you will have an English source segment with a full stop at the end. Thai wouldn't have a full stop because it doesn't need it. So, and no spaces. Yeah, I mean, so any check that we have for spacing and punctuation for Thai has to be custom made. Um, and the same goes for every language now has its own peculiarities. We have to take that into account. And you find the Kirundi linguist in Canada, right? And you decide to assign them the job. And then you realize that yeah. Kirundi is more like their third language. They're not exactly native speakers of Kirundi. So the parents were Kirundi native speakers, but they're not. They're like, let's say, like my kids who might be speaking perfectly, but don't write perfectly or well or at all or something. And uh, then you say, all right, I will cross check with a Kirundi speaker from, uh, and then you find a Kirundi speaker who, whose, whose native, whose mother tongue is not Kirundi. They say that it is Kirundi, but it is not Kirundi. Might be Hausa and Kirundi is the second language or Swahili and Kirundi is the second language. And then you have to cross-check with another one. And this is uh, something like a vicious circle. We have had issues like that in the beginning. But uh, we learned the hard way, meaning, especially when, when we started dealing with uh, Indian locales in which there's no standardization first. And people might be talking at least, speaking at least two Indian locales like being fluent in Hindi and Marathi, which are very similar languages, but uh, similar doesn't mean the same. So uh, asking from a Marathi linguist to provide you uh, with data for Hindi or the other way around doesn't exactly work. So we've always had like this, I mean, after a certain stage, we we've always had the security layer of at least two linguists per locale so that we cross-check what we kind of validate what they give us back. Uh, and uh, it was turning out more often than not that uh, some people were just giving something different back. It was not that language. It was a different language or a mix languages. Uh, so the lack of standardization uh, is one thing. Finding reliable people, either in-country linguists or linguists who have moved somewhere else in Europe, let's say, or Canada, um, and haven't been in touch with the actual language for a long time. So they say, yeah, we do speak that language, but they used to speak that language. It's not exactly the same. Right? They're not in touch with that language anymore. Um, so it has to do with the, the human resources too. So it's low resource, not, also, not just in terms of data, but also in terms of human resources. It's very challenging. And uh, then it has to do with uh, the actual 
uh, uh, structure of uh, the language. For many of these, uh, there's also no standard. Like, you know, it might be like, oh, we use apostrophe all the time for that. We separate this all the time. And others say, oh, no, there should be no apostrophe. Like, there are multiple schools of grammar. And this can be very challenging. But what we've learned the hard way is that uh, in those languages, you cannot really go for perfection uh, at the beginning. You know, we start with a bit lower expectations and uh, you grow. Uh, but you have to update your data all the time. You have to update your models, your data, your rules, everything all the time based on the feedback. And uh, I think we're at this point where we feel very confident about our checks in uh, those low resource locales, if you want. Meaning that, you know, it's very easy to find reliable linguists and a lot of reliable data in European languages. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, try to go out of Europe, get out of Europe and find reliable data, reliable linguists, uh, and so on. There are, but uh, linguists, yes, you can find, but you need to pay a lot for the reliable ones and you need to find them because everybody wants that linguist. Uh, so when we were coming up with uh, a linguist that we wanted to work with us, it was turning out that he had just been hired by Amazon, Google, and so on, because you know, that was a good linguist for that language. <laughs> I know, it's not easy. Um, yeah. Okay. Final question for Yanni. What do you think is wrong with our industry? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't expect that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. If, if you actually know what to say, then maybe Vasily can do it. I thought I'd actually... No. Nope. <laughs> he wants me to be... You, you'll, you'll, you'll let him roast. Okay. He wants me to be exposed. This is why he says I'm a tornado. Like, okay, the, that's that's why exposed. specifically I this asked is, you. This yes, is where I come in and say, do you want it alphabetically? <laughs> <laughs> Can you maybe pick one which you think is like the the worst one? No, 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 no. <laughs> oh I don't. Gosh. I was just joking. I was just joking. First of all, uh, I think that when it comes to technology, uh, our industry compared to almost any other industry is way back, and this means that. Every time there is a trend, a hype, whatever, we feel that we are way ahead. No, we're not. We're still way back, right? I feel that a lot of our companies, and that might even include us, would not exist in 2023 in our industry. Like lexica, phrase, or... Put whoever you want in that bag of brands. We should have been there 10 to 15 years ago, 10 years ago. At this point, we should like have been, we should have been there 10, five to 10 years ago. Uh, when, uh, like five years ago, when everybody started talking about NMT, and now everybody started talking about ChatGPT, even for ChatGPT, you see that. People in our industry feel that this has to do with our industry, like the localization industry. No, we can be affected. It also involves us and so on, but it is not an achievement of the localization industry. <laughs> it comes from the outside. So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing has uh, to do with uh, uh, the fact that I, I feel that a lot of uh, a lot of LSPs have uh, actually done, a lot of the traditional LSPs have actually done more harm than good. And uh, why? One thing has to do with the fact that they transformed the translator's profession into something which resembles more to a factory job. Um, so why would someone want to be a translator nowadays? And 
if you want to be trans or become a translator nowadays, for how long do you think you can be working for an LSP, let's say? Not that much. So the burnout is, is there. You will have it one way or another sooner or later. And uh, the other thing is that uh, the last thing for me, at least, I think there's a list of things, but I'll try to uh, finalize my words with this one. No, yeah, I will. I will. I will. I will. Uh, has to do with the fact that. Uh, uh, okay, we, keep we it short. Keep it short. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> are Are uh, you thinking about like a politically correct way to say it? Or no, 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 because I don't have that uh, issue. At least I'm okay, politically good. correct <laughs> at all, at all, at all, at all. So no worries about that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the the thing is that. Uh, our industry is based a lot, a lot on networking, and less on it's less product based. It's more network based, meaning that even if you don't have any product, let's say that you are you have an idea with no product, you have a process with no product at all, or whatever, but you have a strong network, you might achieve much more than someone with a strong uh, product, and. Uh, this can be frustrating for people who start building products who invest a lot of time and effort for problem solving so what i notice and this is not a personal frustration it was a personal frustration years ago it's not anymore right just to be clear uh, a lot of us try to solve are in this industry just because we want to solve or we try to solve some problems in what we love which is languages and we noticed that a lot of the people in this industry have nothing to do with languages. They're here because, you know, they're, they're managers or whatever they use to manage other sorts of companies, but they realize that they can also do that in languages. They don't care about languages or problem solving in languages at all. And this affects the whole cycle of our industry at the end of the day, because we often have a bunch of managers who know nothing about what is going on and they try to decide you know, nothing about the product, technology, the actual work in our industry. And they become the decision makers or even the references. Uh, and they tend to ignore those people who put all, who invest all their effort, time and money in building products which will solve the problems, some of the problems mm -hmm. in the industry. So at least those they try, don't really, don't ignore them. This is why I have at least one principle. Whoever writes to me on LinkedIn or sends me an email or whatever, and they say, you know what, we are building something. Uh, do you want to see it or whatever? I always say yes. And uh, I will not do any name dropping, but seven years ago when we were starting, I wrote a lot. I So my advisors told me, you know what? You will have to write a lot of cold emails, like find those people that you want to ask and write a lot of cold emails. So I wrote a lot of cold messages on LinkedIn and so on. Um, 99 of them, like no response at all, no connection, no response and so on. But you know what? There was a guy who is the CEO of the founder and CEO of a very important language technology company. And he invited me to his office next day, said, come here, we'll discuss, I will share my experience and so on. And uh, we've met a lot of times since then, it has helped me a lot. I haven't given him anything back, he doesn't have anything to gain from lexica and so on uh, but for me this guy has served as an example uh, like okay this is how i wanted to be treated and this is how i want to treat anyone who would be in my position and in my place and would just send a cold message and like oh you know i'm building that can you help can you just can we just talk about it sure anytime <laughs> Right. 
What's his name? <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a good example. You don't want to name someone? No. Uh, because I haven't asked for his permission, but uh, yeah, he's a good example. He's German. He's German. Okay, he's a German. very good German example. Going back to where we started the whole interview, right? All right. Um, my final question for Vasily would be... <laughs> How do I ask that? Mm. If you could speak to the minds of everyone in the industry, what would you tell them? Mm. I think uh, if I wanted to keep it as a short and catchy message, it would be, don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. I've realized over the years that uh, both when we are at the first few steps of our career, whether as learners or professionals, but also later on, you can see it with more experienced people in the industry that they're afraid of change. So I would say don't be afraid. 